there, so I'm grateful that we could sort of utilize the whole space today. Um, we have an exciting discussion ahead of us on digital currency, distributed ledger technology, and cross-border payments, and a fantastic panel here to talk to us about uh, this, this interesting and, and wide-ranging set of topics. Um, I'll read through everybody's bios, and then we'll have short remarks by each of the panelists before we do some discussion on the panel and then open it up for Q&A. Uh, so immediately here to my right is Dr. Ndungu, who is the Executive Director of the African Economic Research Consortium, a Pan-African premier, ca premier capacity building network. He's an Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Nairobi, Kenya and is the immediate former governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, where he served two four-year terms as required by law from 2007 to 2015. He has been a member of the Global Advisory Council of the World Economic Forum and a visiting fellow of practice at Oxford University. Prior to his appointment as governor, he was the director of training at the African Economic Research Consortium. He also worked at the International Development Research Center of Canada as a regional program specialist for Eastern and Southern Africa Regional Office in 2001 and the Kenya Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis in 1999 as a principal economist. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. Immediately to, to his left is Governor Ingves uh, from Riggs Bank, where he is the chairman of the executive board. He's also a member of the board of directors of BIS and chairman of BIS Banking and Risk Management Committee. He's a member of the general board of the European Systemic Risk Board, member of the general council, <clears throat> excuse me, of the ECB and governor for Sweden in the IMF and board member of the Nordic Baltic Macro Prudential Forum. In 2018, Mr. Ingves was appointed chairman of the Toronto Center for Global Leadership in Financial Supervision. He was previously the chairman of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, director of the Monetary and Financial Systems Department at the IMF, deputy governor of the Riggs Bank, and general director of the Swedish Bank Support Authority. Prior to that, he was undersecretary and head of the Finance Markets Department at the Ministry of Finance, and he holds a PhD in economics. And last but not least, we have Abdel Banda, who is the founder and CEO of Banyan Infrastructure. Founded in 2017, Banyan Infrastructure utilizes machine learning algorithms and distributed ledger technology to encode natural language financial contracts into smart contracts, to provide lenders with an integrated SaaS solution for autonomous tracking and reporting of contractual requirements contained in credit agreements used to finance distributed infrastructure systems and transportation assets. As CEO, he's responsible for the company's strategic corporate and market development. Mr. Banda also serves as Director of Africa for Edison Schwess Offshore, the leading U.S. shipbuilder and marine contractor to uh, the offshore energy industry. At Schwess, he supports the company's strategic finance initiatives and previously led the company's corporate and business development efforts in Africa. Prior to coming to Schwess, he was an analyst at Sandler O'Neill & Partners, an investment banking firm in New York. He's also the co-founder and trustee of Students Bridging the Information Gap, a 501c3 in the US celebrating its 10th anniversary building computer labs and libraries for Ghanaian orphanages and schools. He holds a BA in finance from the University of Notre Dame, where dare I mention here, he also played football. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no fights, no fights, this is a peaceful conference. Um, as I said, we're gonna have everyone start with some opening remarks. Dr. Ndungu is gonna lead us off. Yeah, sir. you can sir, please. Good afternoon. I'm not so sure when you speak after lunch, I don't know how to uh, make sure that everybody is going to be engaged. But let me say that I'm very happy to be here. And, um, and I think I've shared so many emails with Christy and, uh, and Michael. And so I think I like the team. They're very, very efficient. And so I'm very happy to be uh, here. It's my first time to be in Detroit and the University of Michigan. So I'm very happy that I was able to be invited here. I was told to talk about digital uh, evolution. Especially, I wanted to talk about e-money and the electronic payments ecosystem. And I wanted to give the Kenyan example. 
But it's because this is the fourth year I am, I've been away from the central bank and it looks like everything is following me up. If you look at the, my latest papers, actually, most of the papers are focusing on that because everybody has been asking me right on this. My latest paper was to talk about state and uh, uh, it was to, to talk about digital technology and state and institutional capacity in uh, the global the center for global development. It's because this subject matter is actually coming at a time when everybody is excited about the innovations that are taking place. And I think maybe once I share the Kenyan experience, you'll see how actually even the way we look at it in terms of, I know there is always this confusion about uh, cryptocurrencies and, uh, and also the, the domestic currencies. And I always tell, tell people that let's, let's not go there. There's a boundary. If domestic, for example, in Africa, if a domestic currency slides to the dollar or even to the euro by 10%, there will be a commission of inquiry. And I've went through so many of those. Parliamentary commission of inquiry. Why did the exchange rate slide? It changes massive price structure, mass, massive relative price structures. But we have seen Bitcoin just crash, and then there's no commission. I don't know who can provide the commission of inquiry. But anyway, we will debate about that. <laughs> then, um, before I go into the subject matter, I'm, you know, when you change your jobs, you also have to remember actually to pay some form of uh, marketing. And this is where, this is ARC, African Economic Research Consortium. It's a, collaborative net, a, collaborate, a collaborating network. We've been there building capacity in Africa for the last 31 years now. And we build capacity through research and graduate training, collaborating with our public universities in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we also have an interactive uh, uh, communication and um, uh, an outreach program that is to disseminate to the policymakers in terms of our research output. We have managed to build capacity in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, to the point where most of the institutions that you see have been strengthened just because of that capacity. I'm one of those products, and there are so many other people, so many others that we can talk about. But anyway, it's good to talk about it because this is also going to be an area of collaboration in terms of research. And uh, the people seated in front here are not likely to see the slides, but anyway. <laughs> Anyway, let me talk about, let me go into this uh, electronic payments ecosystem because that's where I want to start. But my first point, my first point when I entered the central bank in 2007, my, I was faced with this issue about what happens, what, 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 what are we going to do with the, uh, the request to uh, actually license mobile phone financial services payments. But most people didn't understand it that way. It was called M-Pesa. But I want to show you M-Pesa is just one pro it's a product, but the idea stretches far much wider. But the other aspect I was faced with was how do we ignite financial inclusion? And I remember calling CEOs of banks who are also my friends, what do we need to do? And one of the topical issues that came up is how do we bring branch networks to the people? We tried even trying to say brick and mortar is expensive, but we can actually minimize how much we can do. The second thing was uh, agency banking. I sent a group of, uh, a team of people to Brazil and Colombia, and they came, within two weeks, they came up with draft regulations about agency banking. But when m hit the ground, it was a coordinating mechanism for all those. But that is the most important point. But my point, my first point here is that Yesterday, I listened to Women Banking and the presentation and talked about even dormancy of, of accounts. Even today, we suffer from dormancy of accounts. We thought that financial inclusion was opening accounts in the banking system. But I think that the new direction that M-Pesa gave us is that you need a transactions account. Savings comes later when you have surplus. You can include everyone once you have a, an, an efficient a retail electronic payment system. And that's the starting point. That's what M-Pesa is all about. The second thing is that we have talked, I, since yesterday, I've listened to a very nice debate, and I, th I thought that uh, you need to recognize in countries like Africa, where we have market segmentation, you need a product that can navigate across market segments. And it's going to be very difficult. Banks are not going to those market segments because market segmentation is defined either 
distance to the market or even levels of income and maybe a combination of so many other factors. But anyway, that is maybe that's why when I talk about electronic payment system, I will of course come up with why we call it a retail electronic payment system. We want, I want to show that it is actually the entry point in terms of financial services. And then after that, we can talk about financial inclusion and then what happens to the ecosystem after that. So essentially, even though I have some slides here, I don't intend to go through them one by one, but the most important thing is, is uh, just to point out some few things that uh, I like and I've liked. I, I've seen the World Bank came up with a new methodology of trying to analyze payments instruments. And we were so happy about the, even the survey that has been done. And I've looked also at surveys that have been done outside the World Bank, like in Canada, for example, how much cost cost, uh, how much uh, cash will cost in terms of distribution and all that. But I'm, I'm happy to share with you one of the recent um, examples that have been done, is, especially in Albania, is that once you migrate, or let's say, when, when you are using physical instruments, the consumers manage will pay almost 50% of the cost of that of the transactions but when you move to electronic payments actually that 50% shifts to the uh, uh, infrastructure providers so it's an idea that actually electronic payments system themselves are becoming cheaper to the consumers the whole issue is if you have the fiscal infrastructure then you can talk about scalability but then uh, Retail electronic payments, and this is where I come in, is um, one, it's in 2003, the Central Bank of Kenya was given a, an extra mandate, that is to ensure, to, have a, to, to make sure that you have a safe, efficient payment system that will support a successful financial uh, inclusion goal. And then all of a sudden we started looking at how do we effect or how do we bring up a, a, payments, an, a, 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 a payment system, a national payment system, which was not part of the core market at the very beginning. And so it means that you start with the legal framework. And the legal framework, by the time it started in 2003, by the time I went to the central bank in 2007, it has not even been approved by a parliament. And parliament is one of those institutions that it's going to be very difficult to push. But we wanted a, a payment system or a transactions platform that was going to be important in terms of the entry point. And it's also going to be real time. And also, of course, the emerging evidence has shown that if you actually have a successful financial inclusion, then of course, when you talk about financial inclusion, which is actually market accessibility, it makes a, a difference. I'll talk about uh, the mobile phone based data. But the most important thing is that we have seen the successes, maybe I can proclaim that the success we have seen is that financial inclusion has been effective because of having a very well, <coughs> maybe well, should I say, uh, uh, accepted retail electronic payment system. And beyond that, it has actually generated its own life because essentially it has come up with products that are accessible. I've seen studies that have shown that women can actually enter that space and save in products that cannot be encroached. And that for us is very, very important. And uh, we have also shown that when women take up that, they are efficient savers. The, 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 the cycles between savings and investment are reduced. And I think there's a study by somebody, Tavanit Suri in MIT and uh, Jack Suri in Washington. They have come up with a paper to show that actually 2% of the, of the households in, Afri in Kenya have, have been lifted from poverty. So essentially, financial inclusion becomes a public policy that actually can help us in terms of uh, sustainable poverty reduction. But let me talk about the Kenyan case because I just want to be very brief here. There are four stages in Kenyan, in Kenyan case. And then M-Pesa, you know, Sophie, Sophie talked about uh, that there, there was a need for the corporate, the Safaricom is an is MNO, to actually increase, uh, their, 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 it's a need to serve the market in the right way. But actually, Safaricom just took it on the, uh, uh, from, uh, from the air. Actually, the whole issue was Safaricom had a nice system of prepaid uh, airtime. And all of a sudden, everybody started trading with the airtime. Then one microfinance realized that if my customers don't have to come to the city, they can use the airtime to pay for their loans, then they don't have to come and we can do that. But then there was one catch. We have to approach Safaricom 
to create aggregators so that several people can send their airtime and somebody can aggregate and send it to the microfinance. That's how they went to Microsave to do the analysis. I think this has been documented by Bill and Mary Guest Foundation, like um, um, uh, some people who have done some good work. I was trying to document this uh, case study in, in Oxford, and that is where the starting point comes in. And Safaricom realizes, oh, this could be a good case. Let's try to research, and that's how DFID comes in to provide, uh, to provide some in, in intervention. That is where I started, but now, we talked about legal framework, it's only, it only became changed into M-Pesa in 2006 when the government changed the law, or made it the law to recognize electronic units of, current, of money and electronic units of uh, electronic signatures. That is what changed the style, otherwise it could have been a butter trade send your airtime, we know the equivalent amount, and then we can transform it into amount. Anyway, that is a story that we, is for another day, but that is the starting point. The Safari, Safaricom actually realized that it could take advantage, and that is good advantage because so far we have uh, seen how it has been successful. Let me su summarize what four stages in this. The first stage was just transfer. P to P, government or even farms to P, payments for goods and services. But for me, the most important, things, uh, important point about, about this stage is that there was a retail electronic payments platform, which was sufficient and it was safe. I've seen colleagues in the world, uh, some friends in the World Bank and even um, Oxford University, uh, Roland Skrein and the current mayor, they came to the conclusion that actually in Kenya, liquidity distribution is taking place outside the banking sector, outside the banking hall. And that was a very important contribution because it was actually because of the agent model, the master agent model. Again, there's a lot of information behind that. You can talk about agent in, uh, master agent information model and how they resolve the liquidity uh, problem. So in a sense, the novelty of this stage is the transactions account became actually, sorry, the, the trust account became the transactions account. It was the retail electronic uh, uh, payments platform that became very, very important. And the telecoms were just the transmission background, uh, backbone. I've gone to several African countries and they come and tell me that we want a bank-led model, not a telco-led model. And I always tell them that the telcos were just the transmission back, backbone. What is the role of the telcos? They change cash into electronic units of cash and store it in the trust account, which is in the commercial bank. So they just, that is their main function. And they are regulated with the guidance that the central bank provides, plus the communication authority. The rest is left for the central bank to actually manage the payment system. The second stage is virtual savings account. I remember Bill Gates himself really pushed us, talking about, oh, you have been very successful with M-Pesa. Yes, but it is not even affecting the intermediation in the banking sector. It is not, it is not going to affect people's lives because essentially people's lives are going to be affected by one, savings, two, credit, because they can enlarge their asset base and escape cycles of poverty. And then the next thing is that it's expensive. Unit cost was very expensive. How do you actually turn it into a savings platform? And it worked. I remember promising Bill that uh, it will work. Just give us, a, give us some time and it's going to work. Thank you. Uh, no time. So the virtual savings account was a little a magic. But the next thing was use transactions data and the, and the savings data to generate credit scores for use for short-term credit. I think this is the, the, the part I liked most. And today, and uh, I've been telling uh, people that we have seen that the virtual savings account and virtual credit uh, supply platform has moved to five countries. It moved from Kenya to Tanzania because Commercial Bank of Africa was there. It moved to Uganda. It moved to, uh, to Ghana, uh, so, sorry, to Rwanda. And now it has moved to Cote d'Ivoire. You can imagine. I have been looking at that even micro data. For example, in Rwanda, when it was formed, there were 9,000 run applications every day, and they were approved, and the turnaround time was not more than 45 seconds. And the average loan was about $5, and the payments period was 21 days, and then NPLs were very low. And the fourth one is the cross-border. This is the interesting bet because we, we allowed Western Union can only send money to the banking platforms, and then after that, you have to actually get 
travel to Nairobi or any other station to get your money. Now you can get it in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in your mobile phone. Anyway, having said that, I want just to talk about five outcomes. First, I've already talked about the first one, retail electronic, platform, retail electronic uh, payment system, which is effective, efficient, transparent, and safe. This is very important. The second one is financial inclusion, and even financial development has taken place. And we can talk about poverty reduction. We can talk about even something that I'll talk about later, about even the effectiveness of uh, monetary policy. I went to the central bank, and actually, when I looked at I, I looked at the, the the accounts, the banking accounts, and even who was borrowing and who was lending, there was just like two point uh, three point four million accounts for a population of about um, thirty million. Then I asked myself, why do we complain about the banking sector and the reading rates? Because nobody is going to the banks. Anyway, that's for another day, but we'll talk about it. But even I went to the central bank when AML CFT regime in Kenya was so bad, and we tried to improve on it using this. And then, because of time, sustainable business models, I'm very happy about this. We can talk about this. Fintechs, this is where fintechs comes in. They can roll out products, even payments platform, for other, sect or for other sectors of the economy. We have already made a contribution about tax policy and even fiscal policy design, public finance with the IMF in the, there is a volume in 2017. We talked about even, I even provided the Kenyan case study in terms of how even the fiscal, the, the, the Kenya Revenue Authority was designing tax payments platforms on the basis of these retail electronic platforms. And finally, even the government was designing e-government services based on that. Because I have to finish, let me talk about, my, my last paper has focused on four areas, and this is something that we can talk about <coughs> replicability across, the, from the experiences in, in, in Kenya and East Africa, we can even talk about Af, uh, the rest of Africa. I've talked about this in so many, uh, uh, so many um, areas, but let me focus on four areas. One of them is connectivity, and since yesterday I've heard about this. Inclusiveness allows us also for uh, connectivity. You know, the government provided the physical infrastructure, that's fiber optic across, uh, across, the, uh, across urban centers. But the core infrastructure is the one that moved the payment system to where it is. The second one is interoperability. This is a market conduct thing. And of course, the Kenyan case stands out, but it's a whole issue of saying, how do we ensure interoperability? We, interoperability will increase the market size and also lower unit cost. But other issues must come in, but we have to look <laughs> at that. The, then, of course, transformative regulatory technology, that is something that I've always said. There's somebody who mentioned that if you cannot allow innovation in the market, then obviously the market cannot move. <laughs> electronic ID system in Kenya, we succeeded because of ID, but to secure the market, we need to move to electronic payment system. And the final one, and very important for me, is state and, uh, and uh, institutional capacity to regulate. There are risks that are emerging. And I'll give you a story because I don't want to talk about it more than abuse my authority more than that. <laughs> By the time I was leaving the central bank, I told the government, and I even talked to the president, telling him that we have to regulate the betting, online betting, because it can come to hurt the financial system. We have to tell the regulator. I had already written several letters to the regulator for the betting company, but they didn't listen. Of course, they went, the betting companies went to parliament and marshaled the MPs so that the law was not passed. And then in the end, what happens? So now, as, as we stand now, there are more than three million Kenyans that are blacklisted because of betting online and borrowing through, 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 uh, through, through the credit, through the, the virtual credit. The problem is that if you just open up and say these banks must actually pro provide full provisioning, it would be a major credit risk. But for me, those are the points that we would like to replicate the, uh, across the, the African economies. These are the points we would like to make sure that we safeguard. But this is, go this is what is going to help in terms of this digital evolution. Thank you very much. Sorry for abusing. You know, and I, but of course, Thank you don't know. I, I traveled very far. I would be, it would be very bad if I only traveled this far to come and talk for 10 minutes. But I don't want to argue about that. Thank you so much. Governor Ingrid, please. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, when I got the, the, the request to, to, to participate here, uh, I couldn't resist because the 
title of the future of federal banking. And my uh, institution has been around since 1668, and we would like to be around for another 350 years. So it was just a persistent. And uh, back then, 350 years ago, people were carrying around 22 pound copper metals, coins. 22 pound copper coins. No way. 22 kilos, it's about 50 pounds. <laughs> and that's very impractical, so they, invented, <laughs> so they invented paper money. And now the issue is what happens when paper money goes away. So that's what we're going to do here. The other one is, as was mentioned, I'm also the chairman of the Toronto Center for Leadership Training of Supervisors, and Papa is the CEO is sitting over there. We deal a lot with financial inclusion, which is also one of this conference. And so far, the Toronto Center in the years has trained around 12,000 supervisors uh, all over the world. And finally, not least, I'm back. I was here back in 1971. <laughs> <laughs> because then I went to high school in Saginaw, Michigan. And that's where my accent comes from. It's a sort of combination of Saginaw and the Swedish cook in the market. <laughs> 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 but but to the to the topic, I, I of course talk about these things from a central bankers uh, perspective. And uh, central banks they produce a public good or many different public goods. The goods we provide monetary stability, we provide financial stability, we provide settlement, and this is important in safe central bank money. And we issue notes uh, and codes. In many parts of the world, these things are these things sort of work properly. Not everywhere, all the time. But there are some issues that all of us uh, struggle with. And at the global level, one issue that comes back again and again and again, and that's the topic of this panel, is cross-border payments. And another one is sort of a combination of financial inclusion and cross-border payments, and how to uh, how to uh, deal with that. And then you combine that with arguments and discussions about new technologies available and how potentially to use those new te technologies in this, in this uh, context. Uh, two things come to my mind uh, when, it, when it comes to this, that where we really need to get better on the public sector side. One is set up settlement system for uh, cross-border payments. And here uh, in the central banking community, at least my view is that we have not been ambitious enough. And that's because central banks have a national mandate. Central banks never have a cross-border mandate on anything. Uh, because all of us all of us carry our, our own history in our backpacks. And that has been an impediment actually to doing these things in a, in a, in a better way than what we do here. The other one, which is completely outside what central banks do, uh, but it's incredibly important, it has been briefly mentioned earlier today, and that is that in order to do everything digital, you actually need to have need to have a secure online identification of individuals and companies. You actually need a national digital ID. Because if you can't explain to others who you are in a digital form, forget about know your customer, money laundering and and all the rest. Now, if my view is that central banks have not done enough, then what one would expect happen in this field is that as happens everywhere, each other realize, hey, there is a vacuum there. Uh, we can make some money out of filling this vacuum with something. Uh, well, then exactly that's what uh, that's what happens, and then we're, that's where you get Libra and Ripple and Bitcoin and utility settlement coin and all the rest of it. You name it. And that's not at all surprising because then you say, okay, we, let's see if we can sort of capitalize on this, given that we have mastered uh, these uh, technologies. Uh, but then what does that mean uh, when it comes to the future of central banking? Well, first of all, we need to accept that within this field we have failed, and that's why Libra and others showed up out of the blue. And that really has put a fire under central bankers uh, scratching our heads. Now what? what's next and what, what, what to do. Now, having said that, one also needs to be mindful of the fact that central bankers are probably not the fastest animals in the financial ecosystem. <laughs> uh, but when they move, they can move with force. And that's because central banks produce a public goods, and public goods are usually not, if history gives us any guidance, 
provided in a good way uh, by the private sector. So what the private sector does tends to either create monopolies or these systems crash sooner or later in one in one form or the other. And the reason for that is very, very simple and very basic. In everything dealing with money requires legal support. Because money is not technology. Money is what we have in our heads up here. That that is how we define money. And the public sector has the monopoly power to produce new laws. So you need the support of parliament to make that happen in one way or the other. So essentially, the issue we're talking about is how to combine legal frameworks with the technology available, and then discuss what is a public good and what is not a public good. Now, on the issue of real-time uh, settlement systems, let me just mention one, one example and what I think is doable in the, in the future. Quite recently, the ECB has set up its TIPS uh, real-time small value settlement system. So yeah, you can send money within 10 seconds all over Europe, not used very much. It's a multi-currency system. We're presently discussing with the ECB, and within a year, year and a half or so, I hope that we can use this system for settlement from one cell phone to another in Swedish program. Now, if you can, if it takes 10 seconds to settle a transaction or five or something, it's fast. In Swedish Kroner, and then you can do the same thing in Euros, you probably don't have to be Oystra's brother to realize that it must be possible then to move between Kroner and Euros back and forth, also within 10 seconds. So I'm just looking for somebody on the private sector side who would be willing to, uh, to do that. And if no one shows up on the private sector side, several, the central banks themselves certainly can, uh, can do it. But having done that, well then, that of course also means that you have to be able to define who you are, and you have to adhere to the money, anti-money laundering legislation and all the, all the rest of it. And that means that you have to have online identification systems in one form or the other. And that's why I think uh, the Indian example is so incredibly important when it comes to thinking about uh, thinking about this, because it's not the financial sector only when it comes to doing, doing this. The other one which was also the question is that if you start doing this uh, cross-border, you need to harmonize. Because take, for example, a transaction from one cell phone to another in Sweden, you can't do the same thing from one cell phone in Sweden to one in Germany or vice versa, or one in Denmark. Then you actually have to agree on the standards and uh, how, to, uh, how to do that. Technically, it's a piece of cake, but then you have to get a bunch of people around the table and they have to agree on something. And particularly in my, in, in my uh, corner of the world, if you are wealthy enough, you really don't have to agree to do anything, at least for a while, until you get poor enough so that you realize that somebody else is running faster than you run, than you run yourself. So you have to have interoperability in one, in one form uh, or, uh, or the other. And, think, and why is this something that is uh, important to us? Let me give you some numbers, some examples. Uh, cash is on its way out. Cash, uh, as a share, the share of cash at the point of sale presently is down to 13% of transactions. 40% of the people never use cash at all. And if you talk to retailers, restaurants, and hotels, many of them sort of say that we're probably out of cash completely by 2025. Not because they, not because somebody has decided that that's the way it's going to go. It's just that it's so much more convenient to use uh, use technology. And particularly when I'm talking various international fora, people come up to me and sort of hint that I'm the guy who has decided that we're getting out of cash. <laughs> who has decided this? And I say, no one has decided. It's the convenience factor that actually produces this uh, over time. And here, on the central banking side, we have to think hard about why is, it, why is this happening? Is it because we central bankers use old-fashioned technology, paper money? Or is there something else in this that we need to uh, deal with when it comes to providing two things? One is payment systems, real-time payment systems, and the other one is uh, moving out of cash into uh, electronic claim, retail claims on the central bank in, in one form or the other. Central bank digital, uh, digital currency. One issue that we struggle with, and it was also mentioned in the earlier, earlier panel, which is quite important, is that moving away from cash 
also means that earlier you talked about financial inclusion, but these new systems also actually de facto produce financial exclusion because it just becomes too hard to use these systems for people with various types of disabilities. And so far, what I have seen on the private sector side, on the private sector's willingness to actually produce systems that everybody can use, is just not there. Because there's not enough money in producing apps and other, other uh, tools available for people with disabilities. Because if you have a choice at the national level of producing something that a few hundred thousand people can use, or if you have millions or billions, uh, it's easy to to figure out what, uh, what people uh, will, uh, will do. Now, uh, so th those are some of the issues that are important. There is one more very critical issue, I think, when it comes to moving into digital money in one form or the other, and that is who defines what money is. Most people take this for granted, so they have never, ever thought about it. Because they do, yeah, but I know what money is. But talk to the lawyers, and when they scratch on the surface, they, die, they just can't come up with an answer that makes sense. So we have sent a petition to Parliament saying that the last time you did dealt with this, the first time I think you dealt with this in Parliament was 1809. <laughs> and then you sort of came back in 1904. And now physical cash is disappearing, and physical cash is legal tender. That's essentially how you define the unit of account, the Swedish kronor. And if physical cash disappears, then what is a Swedish kronor? Nobody really knows. So we have written to Parliament and said that, like it or not, this is what you do in Parliaments. Once every hundred years, you have to think about this. <laughs> and now, since you happen to be here, it's your time to think about this and, and, and what to do. And what we really, really will need in the future is a legally clear definition of legal tender in an electronic world. Because if we don't have that definition, we don't know what we have. Now, why is it that I'm talking about, about this from this perspective? That's because I'm a central banker, and it's my job to produce a good called the Swedish Krona. And it's my job to ensure that it's good stuff that we produce. Because most people never think about money this way, but money is comparable to apples. If you produce good apples, people buy them. If you produce bad apples, they go somewhere else. And it's my job to make sure that we, in my country, don't dollarize or start using the euro or any other currency. That would be a complete failure on, failure on my side. So part of my job is to make sure that we get the plumbing right uh, so that uh, people continue for another 350 years uh, to use the stuff that we produce. Thank you. <laughs> so earlier today, many people have brought up the, the why of financial inclusion, and I think uh, Mr. Vanda here will help us think about some of the things that, that the governor and the former governor said and, and help us extrapolate to why some of this stuff is important in some of the private sector applications that come from this. Thank you, Adrian. Can everybody hear me? Is this better? Both? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to talk about financial inclusion uh, within the broader context of infrastructure. Uh, one, the global infrastructure deficit, and also the uh, current um, cultural and economic prioritization of sustainable infrastructure development. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you uh, to the Gates Foundation, the University of Michigan, for having me here today. Truly an honor on behalf of the rest of the team of body and infrastructure to be considered worthy of uh, speaking after two central bank governors. Um, this is not my first time at Michigan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the last time I was here was 2006, and uh, we're not going to recall the score of that game. <laughs> and that uh, very sad man. But that, um, so that same year, uh, there were some interesting developments in the world 
Um, I called you not the UN Secretary General at the time, who passed away uh, two years ago. Uh, I was in Ghana uh, last year for his uh, funeral, and it was a very sad day. You know, for me, growing up in Ghana, when he was announced as UN Secretary General in 1997, it was a very, very big deal for the country. And as a nine-year-old at the time, it really opened my eyes to a whole new world of possibilities when you start to think about you know, what your future options might be. And it's never been lost on me that you know, I was one of the few people in Ghana, few kids in Ghana at the time that had access to electricity and cable network news. So I had the, the opportunity to have access to that information that helped kind of shape my worldview in such a profound manner. Uh, and when you think about that within the broader concept, broader context of you know, 800 million people being without electricity in Africa today, uh, despite $120 trillion of capital, institutional capital in the world that's seeking uh, long dated, yielding, asset backed investments, it tells you that something is broken. And at Banyan Infrastructure, we're on a mission harness the power of technology to enable the financial community to help bridge that gap in, in funding the uh, infrastructure gap. Simultaneously, um, I'm sure many of you saw this last week, um, a group representing 30% of global banking signed on to a new charter uh, where they're committing to prioritizing environmental and social governance as part of all their new lending practices. This is a, a watershed moment um, for the issue of climate change. Because in order to truly try to address climate change, we need to think about retooling the current infrastructure that we have. And when you consider that and the already existing deficit in infrastructure spending, there's a real issue that needs to be considered at the highest levels of government and the highest levels of finance because it's going to require a lot of financial resources to bridge that gap. So, at Vanyan Infrastructure, and Adrian, thanks for the introduction, and what we've done is, is really we spent a lot of time studying what some of the challenges were. And the governor I think this was said, you know, money and value really is about law. It's about contracts, it's about agreements, it's about the exchange of property rights. And so we've taken the view of trying to understand the legal structures around project finance. But we've noticed infrastructure projects have become smaller over time. They're no longer building billion dollar coal plants anymore. It's going to be an amalgamation of 20 to 50 million dollars smaller solar and wind projects. And the cost to lenders to manage a bunch of bespoke and heterogeneous loan agreements to bridge this gap, particularly in light of regulation coming out of the global financial crisis, Dodd Frank requiring ongoing due diligence on every single loan, this is becoming a hindrance uh, to lenders. And so we've taken the view of harnessing the power of distributed ledger to bridge that gap. So what we do is we convert loan agreements into smart contracts. And then we connect those loan agreements to the sensors of the underlying assets that are funded. And as all agreements on amalgamation of clauses that are data dependent, we're able to use the real-time sensor data to automate all the uh, contractual agreements and clauses, all contractual clauses within the agreement we built a dashboard that gives lenders real-time covenant tracking and reporting on how each individual loan is performing. Uh, this has been very well received with lenders. We're working with uh, reputable lenders in the U.S. and Europe. We're currently approaching half a billion dollars in loans uh, on the platform, and we started going to market in March. So it's been it's been a, a strategy that seems to be well received. But there's a bigger story here, right? Um, we're still a very small startup, and why should anyone care about all this? 
integrating what we're doing with all the new initiatives that we've discussed over the last couple of days starts to now shape, reshape the financial system and make it more nimble in order to allow it to address uh, societal challenges. So in the issue of digital payments, you know, as we're able to connect digital payment systems to our network, we now allow you know, a lender to have a much more effective lien on cash flows. You know, in structuring these deals, lenders are using the law to try to find innovative ways to perfect the liens. But by digitizing the contracts, automating reporting, we now add another layer, another tool, which lenders can use to try to perfect that lien. So as um, a woman in Kenya pays for you know, water or electricity with M-Pesa, once that's digitized and it's connected to the smart contract, an asset manager you know, in New York or Stockholm can now rely on code to perfect the lien on that cash flow to that asset, which then makes lenders much more comfortable bundling up and securitizing these smaller loans, which opens up a lot of liquidity and allows the funds to flow in order to bridge this massive infrastructure gap. And so the other thing that we started doing since we started integrating a bunch of data points is tracking ESG as it's become very important to lenders. And so you know we have real-time information from the sensors on renewable energy assets. We can calculate in real time and codify all the environmental metrics that anyone will care about. And what's important is this information now becomes a part of the loan itself. It's not a separate sustainability report that may or may not be produced annually. It, it now becomes part of the living data room of the financial agreement. And every single transaction in the event series in this loan's history, in this credit, in this credit agreement's history, in the, in the full loan life cycle from origination to securitization, is captured and stored on a distributed ledger and in a shared view between borrower and lender. So this mutability on what is transpiring. Uh, we're getting ready to come to market next year for our first green bond uh, to help one of our lenders refinance one of their portfolios. It would be the first green bond where you know, each lender would have a token, a key, uh, onto our distributed ledger where they can track the priority of payments and all the environmental metrics in real time. And I think this is very important as central bankers around the world uh, continue to now think about uh, requiring more transparent reporting uh, for ESG metrics. This is something that the task force for uh, financial climate financial disclosures is pushing for, uh, and we're also seeing in Europe that uh, central bankers are starting to include green bonds as part of their asset purchase agreements. So I think you know that combination of reducing friction by ad, you know advocating for for lenders to provide more you know more regular autonomous reporting and you know, creating fuel to the system by actually purchasing the green bonds. I mean, the laws of physics tells us, you know, you want to really become an agent of accelerating change. You, that's the way to do it. Reduce friction and add energy. So, pleasure to be here and uh, look forward to our discussion. So I want to pick up on a, a couple of themes from, from earlier today, and in particular um, that our central bankers here mentioned. One of the things that came up earlier was the decisions that central bankers, uh, regulators face in terms of their how to engage with innovative technologies, whether it's regulating quickly, regulating out of existence, taking a hands-off approach. Uh, and I wonder if uh, Dr. Ndungu and, and Governor Ingves, if you could think about and, and talk, speak to the times at which you've been dealing with the disruptors 
um, M-Pesa maybe about a decade ago and, and now digital currency and how you thought about the decision, I think, in the case of Kenya, to take a watchful eye but sort of a hands-off approach as it's developed um, in the private sector. And then in the case of, of Sweden, how, as you said, you weren't the decision maker, um, so you've taken the, the watchful eye of some of the private sector apps and other things developed, but you're also piloting the e-Krona. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how you came to the, the calibration of how to engage with these disruptions. But I think uh, after listening to presentation by, by the, some of the, the, the key people from the, the, media, the, 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 the telcos and even the Ministry of Information and uh, Communication, I came to the conclusion that actually this is uh, uh, something that can help the market. And I coined the term that central bank should be an agent of market development. The bottom line is that how do you take care of risks? I think in the presentation, what we really asked is providers and even potential market, uh, uh, we're calling them disruptors. They are disruptors. So we wanted that to make sure that our, our law, because of the public nature, the public that we provide, is actually to make sure that we mitigate any form of risks. And so we have paraded all forms of risks that uh, we thought we should, we, we should take care of until we came to the conclusion that everything was covered. So any licensing was very much dependent on have we taken care of any margin risk or any form of vulnerability that may hit the market. Once we were satisfied, then we actually uh, went. I think that is the approach that I Uh, I mean, one very basic starting point was that for us was just looking at the graphs, realizing that people won't use money anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and that's sort of scary when you run a central bank because then you say, well, you know, maybe we're getting out, running out, but maybe we're somebody else is taking over our business. So no, what what do we do? So that's one starting point. But there is another very important starting point also, and most people never ever think about that. Because most people never never deal with the funding of money. They just take it for granted. And that is the fact that banks don't trust each other. So banks have a very strong preference for clearing in risk-free central bank money. And that means that the payment system run by the central bank is the core of the whole thing. And that means that everybody is interested in talking to you about how you actually do these things. Because you cannot move money from one bank to another without having the money passing the payment system of the central bank. Because in that environment, let's assume away the central bank. That takes you in this country back to 1905 or something like that. And those who read up on history know that that did not work well at all. So everything ends up in the central bank sooner, uh, sooner or later. And take, uh, take our SWISH system, which is transactions from one cell phone to another. Now we have, in a country with a little bit more than 10 million, we have more than 6 million users. We were part of that evolutionary process from day one. Because what the general public need not understand at all is that when you do a SWISH transaction from one cell phone to another, ultimately the money actually passes out of payment system. Because the banks don't trust each other. So we have been part of that, and we have supported that from, uh, from uh, day one. And at the same time, of course, one would like to see that this evolves in a safe and in a sound way, so that people don't uh, get, uh, get uh, cheated, and that's why you need to keep an eye on it. And you need to try to move fast enough, so that the whole thing does not move to other, other places. And I mean, this holds all over the world, because if we're talking PayPal, if we're talking Apple Pay, or whatever all these systems are called, ultimately the money passes through the payment system run by the central bank. So those are only, like what you showed about M-Pesa, kind of 
what, what the end users see and know, but you can <coughs> never get around the central fact you want to know. So that's why you are kind of part of this process, and ideally you should try to do it and in a nimble way compared to just complaining and trying to turn back time. <laughs> And just to follow up, Governor Ingrid, I wonder if you could provide us all, especially in the audience here and the audience online, as you're watching your pilot develop, are there any early conclusions you can share or new questions that are, that are popping up that you did not anticipate? Uh, we have lots and lots of tech people come and talk to us. And it's striking that they don't know a thing about money. <laughs> <laughs> they know the tech part and they know how you make money but that's different from moving money and so that's one striking feature of this, this conversation and another very striking feature of it is that <coughs> same thing actually holds when you talk to people who are experts in monetary policy because that's something completely separated from monetary theory. And very, very few people have an education in monetary theory. And sort of the inner workings of money and some of those issues are almost philosophical. And this is and that's this is really the hard part to to create teams of experts with different backgrounds and get them to talk to each other in such a way that you actually create something that uh, that works. And that's kind of where, uh, where we are. We are presently going through a tender process. And uh, we have a number of tech companies bidding for the April pilot. And once that process is over, we will produce uh, an April pilot. But it will be, produced, will be done in such a way that it is scalable. So that to the extent that ultimately Parliament decides that if this is fine to do, uh, we, can, uh, we can do it so that at the national level. And exactly, we had exactly the same conversation more than 100 years ago. Because more than 100 years ago, the banks issued their own physical banknotes, and the central bank issued its physical money. 100 years ago, the bankers argued that there was no need for central bank physical money, and now they argue that there is no need for digital central bank money. So in that respect, there is nothing new under the sun <laughs> to construct, this, uh, construct these things. And time will, uh, time will tell where it will go. But I must, it's pretty hard, actually, to deal with these issues because so much of this is equivalent to dealing with electricity. You just assume that in this part of the world, you, you have 110 volts coming out of the socket, and you never think about how, how it happens. And the same thing with money. You just take it for granted and assume that there is a certain structure uh, that is being used to do these things, and then you all of a sudden realize that hmm, maybe that's not all, that's not the case. It's actually real people who decide on these structures, and you can change these structures over time. But people find it incredibly hard to get their heads around that. And I have we have plenty of conversations with the general public, and they talk about. A, an e in terms of what it would look like. <laughs> and that, that sort of catches it, how hard it is. Well, Governor, you touched on collaboration and how so the, the tech people come in and they don't know anything about central banking um, or financial regulation. Um, I think you know, the same is often true. Sometimes you talk to regulators and it's hard for them to keep up with all the developments in the private market. Abdel, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about maybe just thinking about your experience broadly beyond just Banyan, but, but also um, back to your history in, in investment banking. But now you've sort of seen this opportunity taking your cues from some of what's happening in the financial inclusion space, in the ESG space, and use that to find your business opportunity. So there is a, a collaboration of sorts there, and I wonder if you could just speak to that and tell us how you how you look to central banks and other authorities to decide how to form your technology for a business opportunity. I think uh, collaboration is something. Uh, so, in my comments earlier, rushing at the end, but I was trying to allude to the friction that exists, you know, in, in the market being a real barrier. 
area. And, and that friction is really there because you know, lenders are concerned about regulation. And if, if there was no if there was no regulation, no central bank uh, that they had to answer to, banks would just be doing whatever they wanted to do. And we've seen we've seen that story uh, before. Uh, and you know, while regulation is good, I think that we need to think about how we embrace the power of technology to reduce the burden of the regulation on the financial community. And, and that's where I, I would hope the central banks will continue or you know, actually accelerate their efforts to engage with tech companies to really understand that the power uh, of the technology. You know, um, at Banyan, we've been fortunate to get this far because we, we had a few lenders who were willing to really engage with us very early and, and allow us to experiment um, with what we were thinking in a broad way. And I think on the regulatory side, more of that engagement will make the lenders feel comfortable around you know, the, the products that we're, we're bringing to market, and that, that could accelerate the rate of uh, adoption. So coming back to this idea of sort of different different jurisdictions being at, at different places. I wonder, uh, Dr. Ndungu and, and Governor Ingves, if you could tell us maybe a little bit about the, the conversations you've had or experienced in terms of, with your counterparts across the world um, and how others are, are thinking about central bank digital currency where some are, are really leaning in and experimenting with, with going cashless, maybe being led there by their constituency, um, while others have, have sort of stuck to the need for cash and really resisted the idea of, of central bank digital currency. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think when it comes to uh, jurisdiction, you have to start. Is that on or so? yeah. Okay. You have to start from the home front. And I, I, you know, I didn't push on because one of the things I had big fight with the banks, with, with, with commercial banks, especially in Kenya, that is the time also there was a success in terms of microfinance. Some banks have had succeeded in terms of microfinance. They argued that the small, this, uh, the MPSA is going to actually snatch their customers. But I argued that uh, you need to encourage this because essentially then you can get deposits and even you can earn ledger fees 24-7 because essentially you can get everyone actually participating in the payment system throughout the night. And uh, I think I remember I was in the U.S. Treasury and uh, give, uh, making a presentation and, and the, the, US, uh, the, the secretary of the Treasury argue, said that actually you can pay for uh, a, 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 a taxi in Nairobi using a mobile phone at midnight. So it means you are drawing from your bank. Now, that, that is, the Kenyan case was the banks were very much opposed to this, but in the end they realized that, oh, all of a sudden they actually don't need to even create large number of branches. They can use the agency network, they can use virtual accounts. So it's a question of investment. Let me go back uh, when, uh, we, when we started even talking about it. I remember I had so many occasions that I had to talk to the IMF and the World Bank, actually even to explain how it was working. And that was a, a very difficult aspect because at one time it was being seen like, oh, it's a, a payment system with, with no regulations. There were, we, didn't have, we didn't have a legal framework for payment system in Kenya then because it was still sitting in the parliament waiting. And what we did was to, to, to invoke the trust law and then the, the trust account, which later became the transactions platform, was actually a cash in, cash out uh, trans, uh, technological platform, which again was actually um, guided by the, the trust law and the trustees were the owners of the account. This worried even other jurisdictions. Now, of course, in the end, after three presentations, and that is every annual uh, meeting, I think the World Bank and, uh, and the IMF agreed that, that it was working very well. What are the, about the African regions and actually most of the governors in the region, except for Tanzania, everybody else thought that we are allowing telcos to deal with money. And I think this, this, this is an idea even 
I've gone to uh, Nigeria like several times, invited by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to talk to the central bank and even the business community and the banks. And then they believe that we don't want a telco led model. Kenyan model is a telco led model. Then I actually insisted that it wasn't. The moment, the, the whole idea of converting cash into electronic units of the same cash has never sunk very well across even most African countries, even to date. There are some countries that say, oh, it is working very well, but I'm not so sure it is good. So essentially, that, that it is the same thing about the, the, digital, uh, the digital currency. And uh, I made a, a, a point about that earlier. So essentially, it is across jurisdiction, we still have these doubts about how can you convert cash into electronic units of cash and still call it cash. Again, it goes back to what uh, uh, Governor Ingves is actually talking about. I, I, maybe it is a space we really need maybe to come back and try to redefine that. But I think when uh, most observers came to Kenya, and that's why in, um, in AFI, Alliance for Financial Inclusion, the digital working group, it has changed names. By the time it started as a mobile phone financial services working group, now it is the digital working group. And because I was chairman that time, I think I had to host most of the people, most of the people from Asia, Latin America, and even Africa to come to the Central Bank of Kenya and try to understand what is really happening. It is the whole concept across the jurisdiction that how do you have electronic units of money in your phone, and then it is also in the in a in a in an account uh, in the same way. Now, of course, that comes back to the uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, and. Um, I remember there was a big item in the news last year. A woman in Kenya was actually saying that she pays her bills in a hotel using the Bitcoin. And it was a good analysis and uh, they missed only one point. How do you make the payments? But the whole idea, and the journalist went on even hunting for the governor, luckily I wasn't there. And then, <laughs> then, they, were asked, then they were asked, did you ask how the payments are made? And essentially, it's the, if you have a wallet, if you have a wallet, Bitcoin wallet, then you can change units with the same wallet, isn't it? And then we say, if you really want to make Kenya shillings out of that or dollars out of that, you still have to go to a POS, to a point of service. And that's when they said, don't ask Central Bank to talk about or even to accept a currency that doesn't know the origin, doesn't have rules of the game, doesn't have a legal framework that you can rely on. And th that is how we were escaping this debate. So across jurisdiction, everybody was like, no, the central bank should allow uh, cryptocurrency. And then the question was, where is it coming from? Who is? And I think this is the, the kind of uh, uh, issue that Stefan is raising, that maybe it is the failure of central bank to allow some innovation, but central bank has to go through the ground rules that are supposed to be required because at the end of the day, if you lose your income, there's no mercy for the central banker because they come back and say the central bank did not advise. That's why I started by saying, once you have the risk mitigation and we paraded a lot of risk mitigation, and then we paraded the legal framework that is required, and then we paraded the guidelines that are supposed to be followed, then you'll be sure that the, it will work nicely along those sides. In fact, I've been uh, looking at different literature and I've realized that the description of M-Pesa is one of the most successful uh, uh, regulatory sandbox. But when we were doing that in Kenya, we didn't realize that's what we were doing, but actually <laughs> that is the case, that is the outcome that is showing up. First issue is the payment system, wholesale and retail. And ideally, it should be nowadays, or a few, a few years down the road, 24 7, both wholesale and retail. And if it's uh, real time growth settlement, then you don't need to post collateral because you don't close the system at night, and that reduces the need for collateral in the system in, in, in the system as a whole. And eventually, also, those in the banking community, community think through this and come to the same conclusion that it's probably better to do everything real time because then you don't have to post collateral and stuff like that. So that, that's a good thing. The other part of it is uh, a central bank digital currency, and that in some sense is a bit of a different issue because here we already, and we have had for years and years, 
called, say, central bank digital currency, because banks deposit money with the central bank. So there the underlying issue is to what extent uh, a retail central bank digital currency is a complement to what you already have. And here it differs enormously from country to country, depending on what kind of a monetary system you have, and to what extent does the, the, the country in question is underbanked or overbanked, whether you trust private institutions or whether you don't trust private institutions at all. So that's, that's an issue there. And then finally, uh, cash as a backup is not going to go away because if the lights go out, you can't do the thing. And then that means that it's my responsibility and it's nobody else's business to understand how I do it to make sure that we can distribute cash all over the country if need be, if there is a problem. And the private sector will never ever do that sort of voluntarily. So that needs to be there. Now, to your point about the conversations you have had about where, where is my money? Because that's essentially, I mean, we are constructed up in our heads to think about things in a very tangible, and that's how we think about notes, coins, gold. And then all of a sudden everything becomes digital, and then, then people ask themselves, where is my money and what does it look like? The good answer is not to say it's, it's in the cloud. <laughs> and say, in whose cloud? <laughs> and where do I find the cloud? <laughs> and that's where it gets really, really difficult to deal with these issues. And that's where you get into the whole issue of trust. And who is actually backing up this system? Is it the government or is it somebody else? And this, of course, varies enormously from jurisdiction uh, to jurisdiction. And in the worst cases, you are better off if we take Zimbabwe or Venezuela to actually use somebody else's cloud or somebody else's money, and where you have trust to do it do domestic. But in addition to that, it doesn't really matter if, if you are talking about cell phones, computers, iPads, cards, whatnot. That's kind of is irrelevant. The key is actually to make sure that you can use many different technical ways of storing your money and making your payments. That is really, uh, really the key to it. But when you do that, then you also get into the issue that was alluded to this morning, the cost of doing this thing. And let me give you one example. I'm not good at the numbers, but I think that sort of, there are sort of ballpark numbers, but they're not completely off. Uh, my personal view is that parts of Europe is seriously overbanked. And that has, to change that, has been seriously resisted for decades. Now, in those parts of Europe where you're overbanked, you tend to have a cost to income ratio around 80 to 90 percent. Nordic banks tend to have a cost to income ratio of around 45 to 55. If you set up an, a, a, a new bank today with a banking license, you would get basically just an internet bank, maybe you get to a cost to income ratio of about 20, 25 percent. And then we heard earlier this morning about the marginal cost of one more transaction if you use modern systems. Now, that is going to be disrupted. There is no question about that. And either you go with the flow, and you are capable and willing and able to scrap your own mainframes, or you just fight it and fight it like crazy, hoping that you will survive. And that's an underlying issue. And let me give one real example from my world. We started talking to, to our banks, I'm talking about the major banks in the country, about a year ago. And we said, guys, we're heading into an environment and, and a world where payment systems can be run technically 24 7. So, what about extending our opening hours? And I had in mind really extending our opening hours. Our, our payment system, our wholesale system, opens at 7 and it closes at 5. A few of them came back and said there is no need to extend their opening hours. And then this month we will actually extend the opening hours from 5 to 16. <laughs> that's not the future. <laughs> that's not the future. Eventually somebody else is going to show up. If, that's the pace at which we change things and say, hey, we can run this 24-7. But those are sort of some of the issues that one has to be part of, part of bottom. 
because we have all in our backpacks a certain structure of the financial sector, and that structure will have to change. And still, when that change takes place, we need to maintain trust in the system because otherwise, the whole system. Will I think we've got about 15 minutes left, so I'd love to open it up to audience Q&A. Yeah, yeah. And please make sure you introduce yourself, wait for the mic, and then introduce yourself as you're asking your question, I think. Yeah, I think David has a... Hi, my name is uh, David Eric, and I'm a co-founder of a fintech called Petal, and also a co-founder of a nonprofit with Joanne Barefoot uh, called the uh, AIR, the Alliance for Innovative Regulation. Uh, I want to thank uh, Adrian and Michael for pulling this together. This has been just a phenomenally thought-provoking and interesting conference. I also want to thank our three distinguished guests, because this has really been a very, very interesting session. Uh, I have a question. Uh, actually, it's for Governor Ingves. Um, with regards to the transition to an e-currency, uh, one of the primary um, values of cash is privacy, privacy of transactions. Uh, and as we all know, uh, and perhaps foreshadowing our next session, it's also one of the great pitfalls of, uh, of, of cash is the access to money laundering and the heinous crimes that that can enable. Uh, as you start thinking about transitioning to an e-currency, how important is the question of privacy? Is that a question that is a part of what a central bank should be concerned about? And if so, what frameworks have you been thinking about? And what data will you see? But and what kind of history you have. But the key to this is really, if you start thinking about it, so maybe by thinking about it in terms of the pilot that we're doing now, if you, if you create something digital which is fairly cash-like, then it's a must to apply the same AML rules that we use for cash. And the world has changed enormously on that side because you cannot anymore buy things with a suitcase full of cash. I mean, that just would not work. So in that sense, the world has uh, the world has really changed. And the real underlying issue is what preference you have. Is it better to have the government knowing about what you're doing or some private company knowing about what you're doing? And what, in both cases, what are the, uh, what are the safeguards uh, when it comes to the business? So, our bottom line is basically to say that the rules have to be the same, it doesn't really matter whether it's digital or whether it's uh, physical, and the world has really, really changed when it comes to how we deal with the money laundering issues compared to the way things were dealt with in the past. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Dominguez at the University of Michigan. So. Um, the central banks, all the central banks I know of, have a national mandate, which I think uh, you mentioned as well. And uh, they're not global. Uh, they're uh, really focused on what is best for the domestic economy. Uh, but all that we've been talking about is this kind of um, idea of trust and potentially cross-settlement uh, of payments. And I'm just curious. Uh, since we're talking about the central bank of the future, uh, how would we actually move from this kind of very nationally focused uh, uh, set of institutions, um, or, or would the central bank of the future, in your uh, minds, actually be an international central bank, or are we gonna stick with the current kind of country by country model and have coordination across them? Just curious about where you think that's going. There is no support for a global central bank presence. No <laughs> zero political support for that. So the it's only years, no, no, no. The only <laughs> the only way to do it is to have central banks uh, cooperating in, in one way or the other. Because I mean, this issue sort of is constantly 
kind of under the surface, and we have the IMF, and we have the FDR, and technically you could sort of let that evolve over time, <coughs> but in the near future, it just ain't going to happen. I think uh, different, uh, different, di different jurisdictions can answer that question differently because uh, I think from where I come from, especially the African region, central banks are really good agents of market development. And once the market has developed, then they move on to their core market. Because essentially, there is always, um, the core markets are always well defined. One of them is monetary policy, financial stability, and of course, support government, now we have national payments, and then support government's uh, national development agenda. The next, the question is, what is government's national development agenda? One of them is actually supporting the market. But once you've done that, then you move on to the next, but perhaps you let the market flow. And that, 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 is, that is going to be, maybe the, the central bank of the future is actually to look at how do you nudge the market to the right direction, and then when do you leave? exit that market? When do you exit that the market has actually, should I say, um, produced the right uh, environment and is actually evolving on its own, on its own? That is, you are out for the endogenous development. And that is from the region that I come from, if the central bank doesn't provide that kind of shepherding and, and nudging the market in the right direction, then obviously it will be failing in terms of the national uh, development agenda. But it doesn't have to be there after the market has evolved. Maybe that's the way I would look at it. And uh, of course, everybody talks about regional integration, and we, we meet, I think. The best we have done in the East African region is to adopt the same kind of monetary policy framework. And um, I'll talk about it. So one of them was the encouragement from Stefan those years uh, when everybody was moving into inflation targeting. But beyond that, how they use different instruments depends very much on the market development, on their own market development, and how the central bank have pushed the market development in, in that kind of sphere. Can I, yeah. can I add to that, though, that one thing that is happening also in a world where you have many, many central banks, and this holds particularly for, for smaller countries, is a, is a world where it becomes less and less likely that you develop your own system because it's just cost too much to do that. And when we're talking about digitalization, when we're talking about, let me, let me give you an example. When I was a young man in the options business and, and I dealt with stock exchanges and things like that, everything was made, put together domestically in one form or the other. Today, you can buy a stock exchange off shelf. In the future, it's highly likely that you can also buy a digital currency off shelf because it's not that hard actually to, to produce these, these things. And in that environment, it's one thing to be responsible for things, but it's a different thing in terms of where actually the servers are located and how you operate, operate the systems. And take our present payment system, which is getting the, the wholesale system. It was actually from the beginning developed in South Africa. It's owned by an Italian company. And I think that the good, good, a good chunk of the rewriting of the code is probably done in India, or I don't know where it's done. But it's actually, that's how these things evolve nowadays. And that's globalization, because it's unrealistic for us to hire 200 IT people and do all this on our own. Uh, because it's much more efficient to have somebody else uh, doing it. But it takes quite a while to get to that point because once people say, well, you know, are you buying this from somebody else? Um, they, they, they get kind of a bit suspicious. And this is really where it pays to, uh, to cooperate. Hi, uh, Matt Corley, a former commercial banker and now an MBA student at the University of Michigan. Uh, it's, it's clear that the pushback uh, on Facebook's Libra is that we need a much closer partnership between the public and private sector. Uh, it, I'd be curious to get all of your opinions on kind of what is the best way to collaborate towards, you know, a global currency of the future. <laughs> if, I, if I knew that, I probably wouldn't be here. So a, a second best is to ensure that we have transaction systems that are efficient 
and that can handle these things because most likely we will still continue to have national currencies, but we maybe we will have fewer national currencies in the future than what we have had in the uh, in the past. And how that will evolve, I just uh, I just don't know because there has been so many attempts and so many political conversations of the, uh, uh, over the years, let's say in the context of the IMF. Uh, to think about a global currency, but as long as nation states produce laws, uh, then that's just the way things will stay. Good afternoon, Chris Calabi from the Gates Foundation. In the 20th century, central banks, regulators, and organizations like the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision wrote standards and rules. These are words written down that tell people how we expect banks and other types of institutions to behave and what they should and shouldn't do. But today and yesterday, we've been talking about artificial intelligence, and we've been talking about automation and 24 by 7 availability and intelligent agents, and Abdel is writing code to help monitor smart contracts and so on and, and loan agreements. So might the Central Bank of the Future or the Basel Committee of the Future stop writing rules and instead write code or maybe mandate the use of certain technologies. And Abdel, would you be happy in a world like that? <laughs> so for our two governors, maybe first on, on, on what might change about rule writing in the future. I would be happy in a world like that. I think it would make for a much better world. Um, but you know, in my opinion, I think you, you typically see that innovation that seldom comes from within. Um, you know, there's a reason why Kodak didn't invent Instagram. Um, usually you need a fresh perspective. And so I'm of the view that, you know, collaborating with third parties uh, to properly, you know, innovate is probably the best path forward. But, you know, the end game um, ends up being the same. Uh, more of a, a digital regulatory environment, I think, uh, would, would allow the whole system to function more efficiently. Uh, I think that you just have to keep at it for years and years and years. And there was a story the other way, the other day in the newspapers about uh, some kind of a postal agreement and an organization which is more than 100 years old dealing with uh, how much you pay when you send, send packages cross-border. And then this is just how these things uh, evolve over time. And I mean, here, when it comes to code or no code, I mean, I, I mentioned the whole issue of a, a digital definition of who you are. For that to be meaningful cross-border, you have to agree on what, what the nature of that kind of a definition would be. And that would require some serious conversations about how you actually uh, do that. Same thing when it comes to the SWIFT system, which is basically a global system dealing with not making payments, but dealing with payment messages. And you need a global standard to, to do that, to deal with that, because otherwise you would have no idea what kind of messages go with the payments. And that's one example where it has been possible to get to an agreement on how this is, uh, uh, this is done. But it is never, it's never easy. Uh, because, I mean, being chairman of the Basel Committee, you sit there, the chairperson, and then you have 50 people around the table, and all of them say that they are right. <laughs> and then you have to try to make sense of, sense of that and just live with the fact that there are many rights, using the plural. <laughs> Maybe we do one more. Uh, yeah, Michael Wiegand from the Gates Foundation. So, you've, you've, several of you have said the you know the existing cross-border payment system is is outdated, uh, doesn't work well. Um, we don't think we're going to move to a global central bank and a global single currency. Um, you know, the TIP system is owned and run by by a single entity. If you think about other regional efforts, and I know that that uh, Governor Ndugu and former Governor Ndulu in, in Tanzania were starting to think about uh, East Africa uh, regionalization. 
does this require a, ultimately, do we need a, a global entity that runs a global payment system? Can this be done just through cooperation? Um, and it, you know, you talked about SWIFT sort of plays some of that role currently, but like Abdel says, innovation you know, rarely comes from within a, a monopolistic company. Uh, where, where it's, what's the way forward? How do we think about this? And is, do we need new entities that can help drive a whole new um, cross-border payment system? I, don't, I think it would be just too difficult because each and every time we start thinking about something global, creating a better world, nothing moves because it's just too hard because it's sort of say, let's create a Cadillac or a Rolls Royce. It never gets done. And all those who have been involved in major IT projects know that. So if you aim for a Fiat 127 on a sort of a regional basis, uh, that's one way uh, to start. And maybe this is not a very good comparison, but it, it has something to do with your question. The first cross-border mobile phone system ever constructed was the NMT, the Nordic mobile phone standard, sort of G1. And the rest is history. Because it was possible to agree on a standard between a limited group of countries, and then others sort of realized maybe there is something in this. So if you can sort of gradually prove your case, you can take it from there. And that's certainly the case in, in various parts of Africa. And if you agree on it without talking forever, you just get on with it and do it, then it will happen. And uh, eventually it will be copied by others or others can sort of voluntarily join. Because each and every time you try to create something where you impose things on others, it just won't happen. Or at least that's my, my view. I, I, and, and I think uh, what Michael is you're mentioning is that we, we tried to do that in East Africa. We created the East African payment system. And then the first step was actually to, to link up the RTGSs, those countries that didn't have very adequate real-time growth settlement. We, they managed to get funds from the African Development Bank and the World Bank, and they were able to mount that. The next thing was actually when it came now to cross-border payments, which required that you, you can actually use the local currencies. So what hit us very badly was actually the, first of all is the, the national payment system in each country. We, we were not very well aligned. But the, the most inhibiting was actually the bilateral, bilateral exchange rates. And, and in a sense, nobody wants one currency to dominate. And I argued that we can develop a new area, but nobody, would, nobody thought about it. So we decided Kenya and Tanzania can go about it, and then we'll be posting the bilateral exchange that we find, we fund account. Corporates were funding uh, their accounts in the currencies, in the currencies that were, it meant bringing in physical currency. Of course, we realized that it can't go for, for, for long. With physical currency, you take uh, your physical currency, Kenyan, Kenyan shilling to Tanzania in Arusha, which was nearest, and then you, you bring some to Nairobi, Obviously, nobody was taking this, the Tanzanian shillings. So essentially, it wouldn't go further. So we went further and said, if we have a national, a new area for the East African economies, then it can work and we can push it to that level. But again, it all depends who is the first, who is, who is the leader, who is the leader in this. I think after uh, Kikwete and Kibaki left the scene, everything died slowly. Nobody even talks about it. It is a national leadership problem because once the readers agree, central banks will be very, very effective in moving to the next level. I want to thank our panelists for a very interesting conversation. Thank you so much. I think we have about 10 minutes for a coffee break out in the atrium, and then we'll be back here for our closing conversation.
Hello? Yeah, that's definitely loud enough. Yeah. It was off. No, oh, dude, it was, it was lit up before. Huh. Testing. Yeah. 
have inspired. That's that's what it is all. But it's a very very tedious process, and one has to sort of work for years and years, and one has to come back time and time again and make assessments of compliance. Right. Because it's one thing to produce a standard, and I've done lots of that work, particularly when I was working for the IMF. But once you have produced a standard, you have a group of countries, a group of companies saying, okay, we are adhering to this standard. But then you actually have to have a system where you go back and also check whether it was more than just works. And you need a sort of a machinery for, for doing, doing it. And, 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 and then you need a, a, a sort of a, a way of measuring these things so that you know whether yours is from or not. Take, take the capital rules for the produced by the Basel Committee. The Basel Committee nowadays, and I engineer this as the chairman, they actually send teams to countries yeah, the images up to assess here. to what else they want to do. Do you want to go ahead and just queue up? That you uh, whatever. Sure. 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 All right, okay. so let's try this. And then you get measured, yeah. and those reports are published now. And that uh, requires the right. cost, yes. exactly, exactly, exactly. And those who are actually masters, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. We were up very late last night. Because they, 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 because they, they want the IMS can do. They can send it to you. I know. I know what you're saying. Come up with a 20 page report that makes sense. Right, so yeah, it doesn't should. matter if it's macro, <laughs> if it's fiscal um, policy. If it's and so, do I mess with this or with yes. this? Yes, as you prefer. Okay. Great. And then when we switch to the next speaker, so we come up and right. 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 the stuff, okay. but that's kind of works. Right. And it's very, very sensitive in the sense that many, many are. I mean, coming from this part, having been around here. National topic lady. And have you heard of the fictitious uh, town like Wally?
We're going to go ahead and get started. So folks will just take their seats. We have one more panel before our closing conversation. And this will be our panel on AML and financial inclusion. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce our moderator, Joanne Barefoot. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Joanne Barefoot. I know it's getting to be late in the day, but we are going to give you a lively panel. And I'm excited about the fact that I think our topic is going to weave together many of the things that we've been talking about over the last day and a half. Um, so maybe we'll be able to bring some general perspective to it. I am CEO of AIR, the Alliance for Innovative Regulation, and a co-founder of Hummingbird RegTech. And I am thrilled to introduce my panel and first to thank the University of Michigan again, uh, Michael and Adrian and their amazing team. I myself am an undergraduate alum of the University of Michigan. It's just been a joy to be back on campus. And I also want to thank the Gates Foundation for the incredible visionary work that you do in this area <clears throat> and everything else. Uh, I'm going to start by introducing uh, our panelists. We are each going to make some opening comments and then we're going to have a conversation. And my first guest far to the right is Jennifer Calvary. Uh, my guests have long titles, so I'm going to read them. Uh, she is the Global Head of Financial Crime Threat Mitigation at HSBC and also Group General Manager based in London. She runs a unified global capability that leverages analytics and technology to identify, analyze, and investigate financial crime risk to their HSBC group in 60 countries. She and Aaron both have an amazing background in both the public and private sectors, and Jennifer was previously the director of FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. So she was the senior person in the United States running the anti-money laundering um, uh, organization in the Treasury Department. Prior to that, she spent 15 years as a prosecutor at the Department of Justice um, dealing with money laundering, corruption, fraud, and organized crime. My other guest uh, is Aaron Klein. Aaron is the uh, Economic Studies Fellow and Policy Director of the Center on Regulations and Markets at the Brookings Institution. Prior to that, he ran the Bipartisan Policy Center's work in this field. And uh, before that, he was Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy, in addition to having served on the Senate Banking Committee staff, as did I, but much earlier than you did. So I'm going to ask them in a few moments to, as I said, give some opening comments. But first, I'm going to set the stage a little bit and talk with a wide lens about anti-money laundering uh, in, as an issue in general and specifically for financial inclusion. Uh, Bill Gates famously said, we tend to overestimate the change that will happen in a year or two and underestimate the change that will happen in 10. And here we are looking at this 50-year time frame, and I think it's important to, as we ponder this, to think about the fact that as change occurs over that long trajectory, it's not going to be a gradual linear slope. It's much more likely that we're going to go through a series of sort of hockey stick changes that are going to catch us by surprise. There's a character in the novel by Ernest Hemingway who is asked how he went bankrupt, and he says, at first gradually, and then suddenly. <laughs> so that's what we're dealing with, a big shift to a new world that we know we're all working in because finance is digitizing and financial regulation is going to do the same. The AML system that we have today, I'll be interested to see if my panelists agree, uh, is broken. And it's important that we fix it, and we can fix it. it there's a tendency sometimes, especially in the financial world, to think about financial crime and money laundering as white collar crime or victimless crime. And it's really among the most terrible types of crime on earth. 
It funds terrorism and it funds illegal trafficking in weapons and drugs and looted antiquities and endangered wildlife and in human beings. And the human trafficking issue, just to pick out one uh, facet of this to focus on, the uh, UK Financial Conduct Authority uses the numbers that there are 40 million people today enslaved in, as human captives, uh, more than all of the older history of the world combined. 10 million are children, and a million children are enslaved for sexual exploitation. This is crime that's been growing and that we need to figure out how to stop. And uh, we work very hard to stop it. The industry, the uh, UN estimates is that there's uh, about $1.6 trillion laundered every year and that we catch less than 1% of that with the tools that we use today. And that's despite uh, spending tens of billions of dollars a year to try to catch it and despite all the efforts of the kinds of people in this room who are working from a regulatory and enforcement standpoint um, to fix it. Uh, I've get, you, you'll get my presentation, it's got some more statistics on it, but this effort is not working. We have a, you know, you can, um, you can debate it at the margin, but we've got basically a 99% failure rate. And then beyond that, AML is not just failing, but it's also doing harm. It does cause financial exclusion and makes it difficult for people to come into the financial system, which is the main focus of the Gates work in this space. As been, has been discussed all day, many people can't qualify, they can't prove who they are easily enough or can't easily get into the financial system and have access to it. And so there's been a lot of work looking at the impact of the de-risking uh, process, particularly what we've seen um, in part from the United States in fueling, cutting off of whole sectors, whole countries, and even humanitarian crises. Again, I've got a few quotes here um, from some of the people who have looked at these problems. So we ask ourselves, why aren't we doing better if we're spending so much? And I think there's three answers to that. The first is that the forces of the financial world and, the, uh, and of law enforcement and regulation are using old technology and the criminals are using great new technology more and more and more. Secondly, we are using old analog era identity systems that have just created a terrible, terrible challenge with the know your customer rules. It is important that people be identified to come into the system, but whether you're in a developing country or a developed country, both models are broken in terms of people being able easily to prove who they are and begin to think about moving to uh, a digital identity system that could be both effective and efficient. And the third thing that causes great difficulty in this system is that the forces for good need to protect the privacy of the individuals in the system and the criminals don't. They share information freely, they buy and sell uh, data without any uh, restriction on it. And uh, we, on the other hand, cannot easily share data uh, with each other. And a uh, watchword that has developed to capture this point is uh, the slogan that it takes a network to defeat a network, and we are not well networked uh, in fighting financial crime. So the thing I'm gonna, going to focus on for a moment before I turn it over uh, to Jen, and I'm looking forward to a great discussion of this with Jen uh, when we get into the panel, is that there are a lot of people working on all three of those problems, and the, in particular, people are working on the third one by trying to evaluate the potential of privacy-enhancing technologies to enable safe, widespread sharing of information between banks and each other, banks and governments, across country borders, and so on. And this issue was the focus of a, a hackathon this year in July run by the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK to study the potential of privacy enhancing technologies. Jen was there. She and I were both at their um, similar event a year earlier 
uh, to study new types of ways of uh, limiting the knowledge that's being shared. If you think about a, um, if you think about wanting to buy uh, liquor uh, and having to hand your driver's license to a clerk in a store, there's no reason that that clerk needs even to know what your birthday is, not to mention all the other information on your driver's license. All he or she needs to know is uh, that you're old enough to buy it. And so there's a lot of emergence of thinking about, can we just give smaller amounts of information that solve the problem at hand and not share everything? The FCA uh, invented this technique called tech sprints. They are uh, hackathons. Uh, the FCA will tell you we are regulators, so we don't like the word hack, and so we call them tech sprints. And when they ran the one this year, they asked AIR, our new nonprofit, to run a Washington satellite site for it. And uh, we had a very productive week uh, running the first ever US tech sprint, uh, focusing on AML issues. We had a great turnout of large and small banks and fintechs and a great turnout of government agencies. Um, we had 65 regulators participate in the US over the week in addition to a much bigger event that happened in, um, in London. And we had it keynoted by the FDIC chairman, uh, Yelena McWilliams, who has been a real driver for regulatory modernization in the United States. And she also uh, was a judge in the, uh, the program. And we are excited to say that on Monday, we are going to FinCEN to meet with the director and his direct reports with the teams that were in the hackathon and present their solutions to FinCEN and model a new way of thinking about how to accelerate change by not just having working groups and conversations, but actually getting people together across discipline and writing some computer code. Um, and back to the point that these issues are coming fast, this is a quote from our friends in the UK who said they realize that if they don't move forward, given the pace of change in today's uh, technology world, in effect they'll be accelerating backwards and that they need, we need to move forward even when we're not totally sure exactly what it is that we think we should do. So many, uh, Regulators throughout the world, central banks and other regulators are working on these issues, so are our ones in the United States. And um, I'll just offer this as something to think about and then turn to Jen. Um, who can tell me whose picture that is? Barney Frank, our former congressman, Barney Frank of uh, Dodd-Frank co-sponsorship fame. Uh, brilliant man, I will say. Um, and this, of course, is a picture of Steve Jobs. And we've been trying to ask the question, what would happen if you gave the same problem? If you had been able to give the same problem to Barney Frank and to Steve Jobs, they would approach it completely differently. Can we begin to create regulatory innovation models that are getting the best of both of these kinds of thinking combined at the same table, working on the same problems at the same time? I'll just mention very quickly, I am a senior fellow at Harvard. I have a series of papers coming out on these topics, and I have a podcast show called Barefoot Innovation on these topics, which I commend to you. I had wanted to show you a video from the FCA, and we weren't able to do it technically, but this is one slide from it. I urge you to go to the FCA's website and watch the video of their seventh tech sprint, the one that they just held, to talk about what they think they can do with technology to do better uh, for anti-money laundering um, and the fairness and efficiency both of the system. So with that, I want to turn it over to Jen, um, and she is going to talk to us for a little bit, and then Erin, I think you have some slides as well. Jen. Yeah, thank you, Joanne. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank Adrian and, and Michael as well and your team for the kind invitation to be here today. Um, I did not go to the University of Michigan, but I did grow up about a half hour away from here, so it's, it's nice to be home. And, I'll see if I can't even get a little bit of my prior Michigan accent to come out during the course of this discussion. It's mostly lost, but we'll see. Um, so as 
Joanne mentioned, uh, I, I started my career, my professional life as a prosecutor at the US Department of Justice. Um, and towards the end, after 15 years there, um, became an executive leading prosecutors. My last job at the department was heading up um, the, the, the organization that was in charge of money laundering prosecutions, uh, recovering funds from things like uh, kleptocracy abroad, but also prosecuting financial institutions that failed to have effective anti-money laundering programs in place or engaged in sanction stripping. So from that position, I moved over to FinCEN uh, to be a regulator and to be the uh, in, uh, part of an organization that collects all the data that banks file, all those reports that banks file, those go to FinCEN, and, and they're the financial intelligence unit. So did that, and then moved over to HSBC where uh, I work on the same issues. Um, I moved to HSBC and tell people that after 20 years in the US government and someone who cared a lot about um, uh, keeping communities safe, that I thought I could make a bigger impact on the world for good at HSBC if I could help them to be effective at that, um, at that aspect of their responsibility than I could even in the US government. Uh, and I have to say that hasn't changed now after three years at HSBC. Although it does occur to me that there is now one position left in the anti-money laundering um, financial crime space that I have not done, and that would be to actually launder the money or help criminals to launder money. So I'm gonna keep that out there as a possible future job opportunity. Um, but for now, focus on, on still trying not to stay on the right side of the, of the law. So, um, you know, listening to the, the discussions throughout the last couple days, it occurs to me that as we talked about the financial crime agenda uh, in the context of uh, financial inclusion, it was, it was so much of the conversation has been about how it is a hurdle to or obstruction to uh, that end that end game that goal of financial inclusion um, and I can't help but wonder uh, and have given quite a bit of thought to doesn't need to be that way uh, is that is that is that a fair uh, uh, assessment first of all and if so does it really need to be that way and so I thought I'd just spend a, a few minutes talking about that that question um, before we go into the over to Aaron and into the broader panel. Um, so is it an impediment? Uh, I think it's probably fair to say that it is. Um, and maybe I can spend just a, a moment explaining why, at least from the perspective of a, a large global financial institution. We're in more than 60 countries. We have more than 30 million customers. Um, we are expected to and, and, and want to. Um, uh, make sure that we don't have uh, criminals exploiting our financial services to harm our customers and our communities. So that can be everything from fraud to money laundering to sanctions to tax evasion, corruption, uh, human rights abuse, human trafficking, all the, the kind of ills we don't want to be exploited uh, for those ends. Uh, but we need to try to do that by monitoring uh, transactions and, and uh, understanding the individuals with whom we're, uh, who we're banking and with whom they're transacting, our customers are transacting. So let me try to put a little bit of a color around that. On a monthly basis, we uh, screen 658 million transactions through 200 million accounts. Um, when we get a list of 10 names and asked, uh, you know, do you bank, these are 10 names of individuals, do you bank any of these folks? We'll tend to come back with thousands of, of hits on those 10 names, most of which, of course, are, are not the actual 10 people. Um, and that's if we get 10 names and not hundreds or thousands. And so the scale of trying to do, under the best of intentions, uh, a, a good job at this is just daunting. Um, and the way that institutions have done it today is not particularly effective. Um, and this is across the board. It's the, the system across the board. The way we try to, to perform um, these responsibilities today is we look at transactions individually and we try to understand uh, if they are suspicious of financial crime. So when you have that many transactions, to start a transaction and screen that using rules-based systems means that um, the 
uh, alerts to actual real suspicious activity uh, ratio is very low, so in single digits. Um, most of what we do is clear noise out of the, those uh, high false positive rate systems. And that's just in the AML space. We have separate systems where we look at sanctions and, and clear out all the, the false positives around name screen that we're doing. We have separate systems that focus on fraud um, and try to do the real-time uh, transactions and screening of transactions to understand if there's fraud. Um, and so we go through all these different systems, generate large amounts of false positives, ultimately get to uh, reports that we do provide to government to help them keep communities safe. Uh, in Europe, I've seen some studies saying uh, that only about 10% of those are actually used by law enforcement in Europe, and we've all seen the, the statistics that only about 1% of criminal assets are actually confiscated each year. Um, that's not to minimize some very good work that does come out of that, and there is some really important and great work that, that comes uh, uh, in, the, in the financial crime space, um, but it's, I don't think it's a system that any of us could look at end to end and say that we feel it's terribly effective at achieving the goals we want it to achieve. So there is a large conversation, a wide recognition, I think globally, amongst regulators, amongst industry, that we need to do something to achieve the ends that that, um, that the uh, financial crime uh, uh, mandate is, is seeking to achieve. And then when you put that next to what about the, the potential negative impacts it has on financial inclusion, how do you think about that? So the reason that we see the, the negative impacts on financial inclusion is because le with a blunt system like the one I just uh, described, rules-based, very blunt view to try to find suspicion, we're not very good at finding it, which means that if we're operating in a high-risk jurisdiction and high-risk products, high-risk clients, we ha run a very high uh, potential of missing the real financial crime, and we face the very real possibility of having enforcement actions um, that uh, levy fines over a billion dollars on institutions. Um, and so trying to understand the, the risk there, you end up with uh, financial institutions all making and assessing the risk in the same way. So you see financial institutions all saying the same jurisdictions, the same products, the same uh, uh, classes of customers are risk and we're not sure how to manage it. And so when everyone leaves that jurisdiction at the same time, um, we end up with the de-risking debates with the financial inclusion issues. Um, and so, uh, that's that's where we see uh, the impacts. So then we turn to the question, but does it have to be that way? <laughs> um, is And I don't think it does. So for many of the reasons and the things we've been talking about today, the opportunities that technology provide for us, I think we can go a long way in being more effective at identifying financial crime and thus being far more um, uh, uh, targeted in our actions, um, which number one means we don't have to de-risk entire categories of, of clients, um, and secondly can give us the confidence to go into jurisdictions or take on clients that we haven't had the confidence in the past because we weren't sure we could actually identify risk when it occurred there. Um, we're doing a lot of thinking, certainly at my institution, but others as well, is how exactly do we get from here to there? Um, and we're focused on looking, um, taking all the data essentially at our disposal that we already have, uh, looking at uh, financial crime holistically. So instead of doing it in silos, fraud versus sanctions versus money laundering, look at a customer or their counterparty and try to understand the probability that this customer poses a significant financial crime risk to us today. You updating that view dynamically as we get in new data each day um, and being able to understand down to a very high definition view, what is the probability that someone poses a financial crime risk? And you could imagine if we were able to do that, really zoom in, almost like a camera and a high definition camera in and understand where there is risk and pinpoint that risk and take what the appropriate actions. 
it means that we could also zoom out and understand what a risk is of a product, of a jurisdiction, of a sub-sub-sub-jurisdiction, and, and m be much more able to go into places that we haven't had the confidence to go into in the past. For a big bank like ours, um, where our, our business model is not mass retail at the, at the, um, uh, at the lowest uh, uh, social and social economic end, um, it doesn't mean that we're all of a sudden gonna, gonna move into a different business model in that sense. But what it does mean is that several of the, the uh, whether it's fintechs or traditional uh, financial um, institutions who do operate in that space and eventually need access to the international finance system or products that we're willing to go in and engage those institutions or at least have the confidence that we would be able to do that. So I do think then that there is an ability both to improve our financial crime outcomes, make our communities safer, keep them safe, uh, while at the same time making it so that financial inclusion and financial crime are mutually supportive and not at odds with one another. In fact, it's fascinating to hear some of the ideas, the policy ideas around financial inclusion are, are some of the same ones that are needed um, to implement the, the vision that I just outlined. So things like a digital identity are absolutely at the core of being able to uh, do some of the things that I'm talking about as is information sharing and the issue of data and sharing of data uh, cross-border, within an institution, between institutions, with government. Um, but the issue of information sharing and data is absolutely at the core of this. Um, the only one, we usually typically at, at HSBC, we say there's three things we need to, to really go in this direction, digital identity, uh, information sharing, and then the only one I didn't hear come up as part of a financial inclusion discussion is uh, central registries for beneficial ownership. That one is more aligned to the, the pure financial crime discussion than I think the financial inclusion. But the fact that we cross over on two out of the three major um, kind of policy solutions, I think is, is just indicative of the fact that we're, there's more in common between these two policy goals than there is intention between them. Um, I guess the last thing I'll, I'll say uh, before, before turning it over to you, Aaron, is also trying to think, I guess, as I was listening to the discussion over the last couple days, what the significance to central banks might be to the extent that the central bank of the future offers financial services such as a stable coin or, or in the, we're really working more on the payment rails. And I wonder um, how much of the risks that I have to manage every day all of a sudden become your reality as well. <laughs> so um, trying to deal with all of the cyber enabled uh, uh, fraud, looking at things like the, the swift attacks on the Bank of Bangladesh, does that become your daily reality if you're now running the payment systems? What about you keeping the, the financial cri criminals from exploiting the products and services that, that you're offering? Um, so I, I think I would leave you with be careful what you wish for on that front. Um, um, and maybe it's a new career opportunity. As I won't have to become a criminal. I can come help central banks and, and protect on that, that end. Uh, but I'll leave it there and, and turn it over to you, Aaron. Thank you. We Sorry. need to get the slides turned over. So um, let, let me just start by thanking Adrian and, and Michael uh, for having me and for putting this great event together and thank the Gates Foundation and echo a comment Michael made last night about the fantastic diversity of thought, background, experience, geography, and gender that's been represented at this conference. It's really something that's quite impressive. Uh, and I'm pleased to be a part of it. Um, I, I also, uh, let, me, let me start by saying one thing that I'm excited about, about a central bank of the future, is that central banks tend to be, if not dominated by economists, have a strong voice from economists. Economists hate unindexed numbers. The current $10,000 threshold level for currency transaction reports is hardwired into law and is unindexed. And I think it's very useful. Uh, I, I, I made this graphic when I was at the Bipartisan Policy Center and started delving into this to really think back about what this system was designed to do when it was enacted in the late 60s 
uh, and why the system is broken, per Joanne's question, I will answer it. Yes, the system is broken. Uh, one of the reasons the system is broken is because a system designed to do everything kind of does nothing. When this system was designed in the 70s, it was designed to catch tax cheats and organized crime moving large sums of money through the financial services system, $10,000. I usually like to focus that you could buy a fully loaded Cadillac in cash and not trigger a CTR. Today, there's not a single car. But since we're here, you could have walked into the University of Michigan in 1972 and paid your entire annual tuition. At the average uh, uh, public university today, if you're out of state, you can't. At, a, at Harvard, you could have walked in and paid your entire annual tuition. Pri any, the average private university. Uh, in cash, no CTR. Uh, and part of this is because over time, this system has been bootstrapped to catch other types of criminals. In the 80s, it was moved to catch drugs and drug money. It was then again changed in, after 9-11 to catch and focus on terrorists who use the financial system for radically different purposes at radically different dollar amounts. Uh, and so you know, uh, part of this question then becomes who commits, I think Jen put it right, the real financial crime. So let's look at financial criminals who went to jail. So. Uh, the first one is Denny Hastert, who's in jail for anti-money laundering, particularly for structuring. The actual crime I think he's meant to go to jail for was molestation of a child while he was a wrestling coach, but the statute of limitations for that was a long time ago. And the crime that he was easily proven of was AML and structuring. Uh, since I'm at a college audience, I'm trying to, to, to relate to the current generation a little bit more. And for those of you that knew the, the Jersey Shore, Mike, the situation, was the smartest member of the Jersey Shore, so he knew that there was a $10,000 reporting limit. He was also part of the Jersey Shore, so he thought if he continually put $9,999 into his account from DJ gigs, that he wouldn't have to report taxes on that. <laughs> now, they are financial criminals. Al Capone was a huge criminal. The gravity of what Al Capone did is stunning. He came along before AML, but obviously was brought in for tax evasion, which kind of AML was essentially a tool to catch. Uh, uh, and so, but are these the people, are these the high priority? Out of the hundreds of millions of transactions that Jen's organization is looking and the scarce amount of resources we can dedicate, are these the people that we want to use the AML regime and task the central bank to commit to, to uh, prioritize, because uh, they're, they're criminals. So here's somebody else who's been snared in AML. Um, one I thought in the afternoon we wouldn't mind looking at, at Leo. <laughs> but beyond that, he'd gotten some money from a Malaysian film financier whose assets were eventually seized. And you can kind of go through the story and realize he had nothing to do with this. But ironically enough, the Wolf of Wall Street may have been financed. Uh, <laughs> by criminally laundered funds, uh, which then when you go into asset. And, and part of the, the reason I, I pull this up here is because I think there's a thesis that often goes unstated in AML reform that conflicts with the modern reality of what it of how it actually works on the ground. And I give some deference to, to Jen on this to, to agree or disagree with me, and, and you have more experience in it. But the thesis kind of goes as follows. Criminals are operating in the bottom of the ocean, which is super dark and hard to find. Criminals generate financial profits, particularly a lot of the heinous crimes that Joanne was talking about, human trafficking, et cetera. That profit, like money, kind of bubbles up to the surface. And when, if you could find the bubbles, because it has to go through the financial system to be transmitted, particularly for international crime, which began with the, the mafia returning money or drug cartels expropriating money out of the United States, but either way, money needs to move around borders, that then you could find the crime bubbles, the money would be easy to find, and then you could trace it down the water and catch the bad guys. What I think instead we've actually ended up with is more of a system where law enforcement kind of finds bad guys on their own, and then often kind of queries the SAR database to look at the bubbles up, because at the end of the day, that's an easier case to prove. 
Joanne, in one of her papers, had a nice quote from a former law enforcement official that said, you know, one of the things is you tend to prosecute the easier cases. Yeah, we, uh, we catch the stupid criminals, I think is what he said. And it helps kind of pause this other question, why are we only catching 1% of the money, right? The money isn't, it isn't necessarily where we're looking, but I mean, these are quote unquote real financial criminals. Here is a graphical uh, thing of just the amount of suspicious activity reports filed by depository institutions after Sarbanes, uh, after the Patriot Act of 9-11, we expanded the categories of filers, but so this tries to hold for that constant. But you can see this radical increase, particularly recently from 2015 to 2018, even if you say that's a one year transitory, it's gone up about 30, 40%. There are a couple theses. One, there's that much more crime going on. Two, there's a ton of overreporting. Three, there's a lot, uh, um, we were never reporting the right amount to begin with. And there's some tension between these theses, but let me offer an alternative, and this gets back to my first point. If you do everything, you do nothing well. If you're looking for a needle in a haystack, we've really succeeded in throwing a lot of hay on the stack. And the question again becomes this prioritization of quote unquote, the real financial crime. I like the way that, that you said it. And ask yourselves, what is the central bank or somebody else who's in charge of monitoring AML? What crime should they prioritize using their limited resources in terms of going after folks? And I wanna go in and, and zoom in on one type of financial crime that's exploded since 2015 that is so prevalent, I think there are four operations uh, uh, within a walking distance of this building. The state of Michigan, like uh, uh, many other states to the point where one out of five Americans live in a state that have created state licensed cannabis. Notice I choose my words carefully here. It is not legal cannabis. The sale of cannabis is illegal under federal law and uh, distinguished law professors far beyond me that pointed out that the theory of state nullification is not as true in cannabis today as it was when James C. Calhoun put forward in the United States. It is a federal crime, and the financial institutions are processing the sale of cannabis that is federally illegal. It is a crime. Are these the real financial criminals? Are SARS the most effective way to catch them? I knew the number of stores around here because there's a really easy way to find them. It's called Google Maps. <laughs> you, if you really want to go to the state capitol, you can go and get a registry of all of the ownership. You mentioned beneficial ownership, which is a critical issue. Uh, we had an event on that in, in Brookings. Um, uh, Carolyn Maloney has a bill that just uh, uh, has a lot of bipartisan support, um, and I think it's important. But this is actually an industry where the beneficial owners have licensed themselves at the state level, and you can walk into any state capital and get the beneficial ownership registry for these activities easier than for anybody else. Are filing SARS really the most effective and efficient way? And by the way, here's an interesting fact. The state of Michigan is deriving significant revenue from this which they're depositing, often in cash, is the state of Michigan committing a financial crime? Colorado's deposited a billion dollars in revenue since 2012 from their taxation and licensing fees, et cetera, from cannabis. Ironically, state and local governments are exempt from currency transaction reports, or you would find a lot of these. But on a broader level, if you replace the state of Michigan with a large private person deriving revenue from uh, contributions of the sale of cannabis, wouldn't they be a financial crime? What does it mean for a state government to get a SAR file by their bank? Because they are banked by someone. Uh, and so I, I, I kind of flag this because it, it also, to me, illustrates this question of we're using our AML to go after the wrong folk. And when you preclude cannabis from banking, which happens a lot, what do you end up with? You end up with cash-run businesses, which attract large amounts of crime. By excluding them from the financial system, you have created the, a lot of crime that the voters are attempting to mitigate through decriminalization. This is just as true for cannabis as it is for other people who seek to access the financial system. And it gets to the final tension in my, in my talk, which it revolves between this goal of 
using the financial system to catch bad guys, which is an inclusive concept in which you actually want the criminals in the financial system so that the financial system can report, right? That is a more effective way than having the cash carried physically on airplanes and having TSA try to find the physical money. Versus the idea of excluding the criminal systems because you don't want the criminals to ride the rails of our financial system and be able to benefit and conduct crime more easily because of banking. And there's an inclusion-exclusion tension. In a paper I wrote with, with Michael Barr and Karen Gifford, we kind of take the, I think, belief that there's a win-win outcome for enhancing financial inclusion through AML reform that has two kind of core elements behind it. One is more fully leaning into the idea of an inclusive financial services sector, which then provides information to allow more efficient and effective law enforcement to catch the real financial criminals. At the same time, by enhancing financial inclusion, reduces the real crime that occurs due to financial exclusion. Right, because what, in a Maslow's hierarchy of crime, it's not clear to me that financial crime is better or worse than robbery, assault, other types of, of theft. In this situation, uh, uh, you can have tremendous savings of the amount of money spent tracking other types of financial crime or trying to exclude people from the system and plow some of that cost savings into more effectively and efficiently serving lower cost consumers. One of the earlier panelists talked about the radical decrease of cost of onboarding customers due to technology from AML. And the final point, and I'll close my presentation with this, which is that multinational financial uh, regulate, well, not regulate, but organizations, FATF, uh, BIS, uh, global coordinations have a huge role to play in this because they can set standards that allow individual countries to harmonize and prioritize crimes and criminal activity to, to, to move central banks. So as I think of what the central banks of the future will be plural, I hope they will be working together with a common set of objective standards and goals in both financial inclusion and AML and have those divisions and, and core objectives more intertwined because a financial system that includes more people is a more effective way to reduce total sum crime, which is, I think, the policy purpose of all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. So I'm going to put you both on the spot. I'm going to throw the script that we had out the window. Um, <laughs> And let's just talk, because we already answered the first couple of questions we had, had thought about outlining. So the bad news is the system we have now is not scalable. There's no possibility that you could spend enough money to scale it up and make a dent in the problem. Uh, the good news, though, as and Jen, you said it so well, is that more data can be a solution to this if we can figure out how to manage it safely and, and accurately. So what I want to ask you both is, for starters, if you uh, could do one thing on the policy side, thinking of yourself as a central bank of the future that had the ability to reform this system and that would impact financial inclusion as well as the crime, what would be the most high impact thing we could do? Jen, yeah. Well, I think I, I mentioned two already, um, but if I had to, to pick one of them, um, it's information sharing uh, and, and having, uh, enabling uh, those in the system who need it, regulated institutions, government, uh, to have the data at their disposal to understand the risk. Um, ensuring that information is shared cross-border uh, as we look at the world um, becoming more and more fractious, uh, more disputes uh, between uh, on trade and other issues, 
Uh, we see it playing out in the data realm as well, and we see a rise in data nationalism. Uh, I think that undercuts uh, both the financial inclusion and the, the uh, financial crime agendas. So to do that, what is, how would we go about that? How can we share data more widely and safely? So Aaron referenced uh, the FATF already and as the international standard setting body. As in the financial action uh, task force. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Financial action task I'm force. I'm declaring an acronym free zone <laughs> to try to translate all, right, all our acronyms. I, I will define all acronyms <laughs> from now on. Uh, so it's the, the international standard setting body for anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism. Um, and uh, pr pretty much every nation uh, enacts in, in into law the standards that they set. Um, they have put some things out in guidance around information sharing, um, but probably need to strengthen that. And I think central banks play a role in enacting the laws that are encoded in that guidance and, and hopefully uh, recommendations to enable uh, information sharing. Yeah, Aaron. So the, I mean, the, this is tricky because it, there's some kind of low-hanging fruit solutions like beneficial ownership in the U.S., which is a, a, a Jen mentioned. But I, I'm going to try and think think big. Uh, I was motivated by the morning keynote to think think big. I would try to solve uh, the identity issue. I would try to have a globally accepted, easily accessible form of identification for this, which I think would simultaneously do wonders for financial inclusion in terms of lowering costs to operate and reducing that long list of barriers, uh, and simultaneously reduce the cost of AML compliance uh, systems as well. Uh, and I think that's a really devilly dish difficult problem. I mean, I'm, I'm reminded, in, you know, uh, uh, taking a, a a provincial view of the United States. The United States has no federal identification system beyond a social security number, which I think is somewhat easily accessible for all of us in terms of hacked and leaked information, and for the 38% of Americans who've chosen to get a passport, your passport ID. For the other 62% of Americans who don't have a passport, that's it. We have an identification system at the state level which is just a world of problems. If you talk to the, um, the sophisticated fintechs, they, and, and to the, and the sophisticated banks too, they will tell you that the, the rules that we have for identifying people, so name, address, social security or other government issued numbered and so on, that doesn't tell you anything. You, you, you have to comply with that, but then you have to go and actually gather the data to figure out who, whether people really are who they say they are and where they, I mean, it's just, it's a relic. Yeah, it's, it's um, putting together someone's identity. So again, for a bank in more than 60 countries, and we often will bank someone in more than one country, we often don't realize that we're banking the same person in more than one country. Once you put together the difficulties of identification and, and the elements that, that we piece together to, to understand identification and data privacy laws, we can't even understand our, our own customers in more than, than one jurisdiction. You can imagine the frustration when you bank with us in the US and then you come to London and want to talk to us and we don't know who you are because we don't even understand that you, you bank with us. It's getting better. I think it's, you know, uh, uh, we're, we and other institutions are doing more and more to piece that together, but it's it's nowhere near where it needs to be. And then when you try to put on uh, the ability to detect financial crime in that kind of context, or or the ability um, to have uh, enable inclusion and bring costs down, uh, it's 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 not what you would invent. I think Badaf has a digital ID on their agenda this year. Uh, and China is chairing it this year, so I know there's a lot of focus on whether there can be some progress on that front. Um, so where does uh, use of machine learning and artificial intelligence come into solving this problem? We have all this data, we can't, we don't know what it's telling us, there's too much of it, it's inaccurate, and on and on. How do you, how are we gonna use machine learning? 
So we are thinking about it and we do use different elements of machine learning now. Um, uh, amongst the different branches of artificial intelligence, machine, I'll focus on machine learning, um, although natural language processing is, is probably pretty important as well. But in that space, when we're trying to understand if a customer poses a financial crime risk, we essentially want to know, do you have any indicators, red flag indicators, that we know and the governments have told us are indicators of you being a criminal? So we want to look at that. We want to know, um, how is your activity uh, uh, changed over time? And are there any anomalies that would suggest you're, you're engaged in financial crime? We want to know how you compare to your peers and if you're an outlier. If you're a flower shop, do you have a lot more money moving through your flower shop than any other flower shop? That kind of question. And then we want to understand everyone you transact with um, and whether that tells us anything about your risk. To put all of that information together and under, uh, with an overlay of what's the probability that you pose financial crime risk to us today, we start needing to bring in machine learning to be able to do that at scale, to do it dynamically, to update. Number one, to, to process the, the pure um, volumes, but you don't have to have machine learning uh, to solve the volume problem. Um, but you do uh, to start doing those volumes around unsupervised techniques where you're looking for anomalies and outliers. And so um, we use and are increasingly looking to use machine learning in those contexts, uh, which means that a big issue for us these days is data ethics um, and watching what regulators and central banks and other governments are putting out there on the topic of data ethics. I think Singapore has put out some interesting uh, guidance in that respect, um, and developing our own internal principles and practices to make sure that we're comfortable doing the things we do and are, want to do with data. So uh, I'll have a little fun and, and kind of raise my concerns and flags on false pause on, on AI and ML issues in part because the, I think there are two core issues. One is what is the, mach the machine, what is the machine trying to accomplish and goal, right? AI and ML are fantastic at finding new ways to accomplish a mission that wouldn't have occurred to you or I or a person, right? Go, was it 26? What's the move in Go? Um, the famous AI. The game? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. The AI that made, I think it's yeah. move 26, yeah. right? On the other hand. The machine beat the human at Go, yeah. Um, on the other hand, we don't know what we want to accomplish out of, a, out of AML. Right? When you said the flower shop, the first thought that came to my mind was the slide behind me, which is, I know exactly who's selling flowers and generating an inordinate amount of money. It's the one selling the cannabis flower. <laughs> and like, you know, that we don't have a system. They could detect and find a lot of things that maybe, you know, maybe they could find a lot of Denny Hastert's. But it could potentially target those mm -hmm. scarce human resources to check uh, that question. Yeah, well... Perhaps, or a different way, it could generate a tremendous number of false positives, Actually, right? Think, and so, so it would improve on the, the false positive front. And but I, I take your point well, on the prioritization. So if you if you start to have um, uh, an ability to find more financial crime faster and to understand in more detail what types of financial crime you're finding, now you'd have an ability to take a, a direction and pointing from governments that say, you know what. We only care or this year we're going to focus on these types of financial crime. Give us anything that, that fits that, so, but, that but, billing. But, but let, me, let me flip it a little bit in terms of proxying and discrimination and inclusion issues, right? You know, if you take as a given people from a certain background or national origin or last name, et cetera, are higher risk, right? But you at a financial institution would never purposefully discriminate or have a process by which you say, well, we don't really want that kind of person because that's clearly unethical, getting back to your data ethics point. Now the AI ML says, no, 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 it's not that kind of person. It's a person who subscribes to this, you know, totally weird thing or eats at this restaurant, right? So like, suppose you're really concerned about S Somali people in Minneapolis and you know, you, you, you're trying to figure it out and it comes to shop at this kind of grocery store and the AI flags this as being correlated with being Somali and maybe the person sitting behind the desk on the other side of the world recognize that or maybe they don't and the institution starts to say, well, look, our customer base is causing us a lot of cost 
has this thing from AIML. So let's shy away, let's not target our ads for services to people who've shopped at these stores. So that's, I think you're right, it does come really back to ensuring that we're thinking about the ethics in this, both in terms of bias on the front end, so I think you're speaking of bias, so what elements and data are being used to make a decision? Can you explain the decision was that was made, so do you have explainability around your models? And then the outcomes, regardless of whether you can do that, is, are the outcomes still in some way biased or discriminatory? which can, you could have back testing or independent uh, back testing to, to take a look at. In our discussion questions in the pre-conference yesterday, one of them was, would we support having central banks acting as a KYC, know your customer, yeah. utility, <laughs> uh, and a central repository of data that could be a trusted source? What, where do you two fall on that? Whether we could have central banks is the... KYC utility. Absolutely. There's no question why, that we, whether we could do it. Um, should uh, we? Should we? I think there's a lot of positives, actually. So um, uh, the danger for central banks is the, one of the, the many is the um, question of having to manage some of those risks of taking on that service responsibility, working through the conflicts of offering a service while also being for central banks that also are supervisors and regulators, but those can be dealt with. Um, and uh, thinking about, I, I go back to one of our speakers earlier today saying, how many tasks do you want central banks to take on? Should they be more narrow and focused? Should they take on several tasks? I think those are some of the, the policy risks and challenges to think through, but could a central bank do it? Uh, would it be helpful to have a, a centralized utility in this sense a, a government-backed central bank take on that responsibility? I think it could show some promise. So I, 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 would, I would tend to agree with all of those points. I think there's a lot to be gained from it, particularly as it, as it would lower costs for, for industry as a trusted central repository. I do get a little concerned about the tension that Jennifer mentioned about uh, size of mandate, but I also get concerned with another tension, which is independence. The central bank of the future, to me, needs to be an independent entity uh, in this conduct of monetary policy. And if you're independent in one sense, then you tend to be independent in others. And if I'm a registry of all of my customers, and I won't use the US, although I think one could easily see the applicability, but suppose I'm in England and suppose this is a dystopian future like that show Years by Years, right? And uh, you know they're trying to find all the people who illegally stayed after Brexit. Hmm. And they wanna go to the Know Your Customer repository and most of the people who illegally stayed are probably engaged in international money transmission because they stayed, because that's where their job was and their family. And so do you, you know, what happens when the immigration department calls up the central bank and says, give me your list. How independent is the central bank? How independent do we want them to be from an AML national security government perspective? And you know, communities are smart. If they know that getting a bank account leads to potential uh, threats, they'll leave the financial system. And that's a tension. Yeah. I would uh, offer, and I'm gonna open this up to questions in a sec here that um, I think there's a lot of interest in, instead of using a, a central data utility for KYC to adopt what people are calling the traveling algorithm, leave the data decentralized and, and create an algorithm that can go analyze it within an encryption format, keep it anonymized so that the machine doesn't need to see the, the words that we need to see to look at information. So you could potentially encrypt it in a way that it doesn't create a central honeypot, but there is an ability to go look for patterns. Financial crimes have typologies that machines often, if they have enough data, can recognize the human trafficking looks different from drugs and so on. So I want to ask you about um, blockchains, but I want to open it to the uh, to the group first, and if we don't get questions, I will ask you about blockchains. Uh, Chris? Okay. <laughs> Hi, Chris Glover from the Gates Foundation. So before I entered philanthropy, 
I was on the front lines writing enforcement actions against institutions that had failed to comply with US laws and regulations on anti-money laundering. And often, it wasn't necessarily that they had actually laundered money. It was that they had fallen afoul of the standards that were expected. Uh, and those standards are quite high and demanding. If we know that things are not working that well, what in your minds are the biggest blocks to reforming them? Is it that there's a small group of people who think that actually the system works well and we just need to push it harder? Or is it their fear of doing something different? Or are we afraid to think about new ways of using, using technology and so on? But what do you think are the biggest blocks and, and that we should be focusing on? I think at the moment, a lot of the energy is focused around optimizing the current way of staying regulatorily compliant, um, which is not focused on an outcome of identifying financial crime, but is focused on an outcome of doing what my regulator expects cheaply. Um, so I, I think we need to really change uh, uh, collectively um, our mindsets around focusing on outcomes and using the technology and, and, and opportunities it provides to, to improve our, our outcomes altogether. Um, on, the, on the kind of, across the, I guess across the whole system, there's the fear of the change, fear of the unknown. What do you mean data has to be put in a cloud to give you the, the um, uh, processing power to enable uh, this kind of compute? Uh, we're not sure how we feel about clouds yet. What do you mean you need cross-border information sharing? We're not sure how we feel about that. What is this AI of which you speak? Um, I'm not sure I understand how it works. And um, I've heard really scary terms like black box and unsupervised learning. Um, and that doesn't sound like anything that a regulator should be uh, behind. So there's a bit of a fear of the unknown. I think there's a, a need to, to continue to to um, educate and to focus on what is the outcome we're truly trying to achieve. So, so I had this weird uh, epiphany experience. I was discussing this issue with somebody from law enforcement. I was going on and on about the rise in SARS. And he said, well, you know, I don't see what your problem is. I said, well, each of these is costly. And there comes a point where the marginal cost exceeds the marginal benefit. Right? I mean, you know, uh, uh, that's all an economist says repeatedly when posed with any question. <clears throat> and the law enforcement said, what do you mean marginal cost? There's no cost to, to this. And I said, well, you, you know, and all of it, I said, yeah, where do you think it came from? He said, well, it doesn't cost, you know, it's in the database. It's sitting there. I can use it whenever I want. It's of no cost to me. The more things in the database, the better. And that, to me, was the fundamental mindset problem which was from his perspective, there was no marginal cost yeah. to additional SARS. And from my perspective, there's somebody out there who wasn't included in the financial system because the cost of onboarding him was greater than the expected economic return that that person's account would generate. And I would add to that, I think you're exactly right. In, in speaking with um, uh, regulators, AML regulators, former colleagues, now as a banker, right? on the other side, uh, there, there's a, just a lack of trust when banks say the amount of money we're, we're spending to produce this SAR isn't getting the outcomes. Yes, we'd like to spend less money, but like, let's not even start there. Let's just talk about putting money towards something that would have produce the better outcome, the more effective outcome. There's so much suspicion as to the motivation of the financial industry that there's a fundamental um, failure in trust between two major players in a system that are meant to be working towards the same goal. So there's certainly um, a challenge there to overcome. One of the things I covered in my Harvard papers is this is the single most expensive compliance area and the most dangerous for the industry. So it's a huge deterrent. The industry is not willing to take risk in this space, and they're not willing to cut money, even if it might be more effective for fear that they'll be criticized. Having said that, I'm, I think it is going to change. I think there's a sea change sweeping over us with people realizing that there's better tech. We had a question. We had questions over here. Did, OK. So. Aaron, your point about what kind of crime are we trying to uh, solve for? Um, 
I actually want to hear you to answer that question. Um, I recognize this isn't necessarily a central bank question, um, but I want to posit the idea that if what we want out of this is not just to um, reduce the amount or, or solve the amount of financial crimes, but we want to figure out how to do it in a cross-border fashion because it's going to be more efficient, et cetera, it seems to me that stopping terrorism uh, is kind of a good one to think about, and it's part of the, it's, I would say, the big reason why, why, at least in the U.S., we've ended up where we've ended up, right? Um, but terrorism is not, is clearly not a U.S. only problem. And so I'd like to hear your perspective on that, but also, if you, Jennifer, just from your perspective, you've also been saying that different kinds of crimes, financial crimes, have different kinds of patterns. And I'm wondering whether you think that the way that SARS work today and the $10,000 limit and all the rest of it, if that's actually effective, if we said we want to we want to focus on reducing terrorism, like what would we need to do if that were indeed the target? What does that look like in terms of a, from a transactions perspective and a behind the scenes perspective? For ter terrorism fundamentally looks different. It's changing too. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, we had a, a, a time period where you had financing, uh, uh, big financers of terrorism uh, that came external to the group. Then you had uh, groups that took over territory and earned their own money from the populace um, and uh, took money from uh, by uh, breaking banks, et cetera, breaking in and actually taking cash out of banks, uh, which is a fundamentally different funding model. And then you have the problem of, of terrorist fighters, people who travel all around the world to engage um, in, in uh, terrorism. And so each of those has a different kind of financial footprint to them. Um, generally speaking, if I was going to talk about what's the best, how should we change the CTR to help with, with terrorist finance, I would say go to a zero. Uh, threshold and um, and give international transfers at a zero threshold, uh, provide that data. Um, it's something that already happens in Australia. Canada has a thousand, does the same thing, but has it at a $1,000 threshold. Um, but I, I, I want to take it back to your initial question is, is that in fact the top crime we should be focused on? It's, it's scary. Um, it takes lives. It has political impacts, but it's pretty low incidence. What about fraud? Fraud hits almost every. What about elder abuse and, and people who lose their money through fraud? That's high uh, volumes of folks who, who experience that. Should we focus there instead? Uh, what about corruption and grand corruption in, in, where you have uh, nation states that fail because high-level political officials loot the country dry and, and move that money abroad. Should we focus our, our efforts there? Um, I think there's a number of good places, but I agree, you can't be everything to everyone. So if we really want to make an impact for good, I do think it would be helpful to have governments prioritize. I think central banks can play a role in stimulating that conversation because you need to bring together policymakers, um, enforcement and security services, regulators, um, into a, a conversation to, to be willing to set forth uh, a, a combined view of what the priorities are, which is you know, never an easy thing. <laughs> so um, corruption is valid, but I debate, I think the next person to enter my slide uh, show is Paul Manafort. Mm -hmm. uh, who had, I think, nine uh, shell companies in Delaware without beneficial ownership, and also among the other crimes that, that, again, one of the reasons this is such a powerful tool for law enforcement is whatever you think about what Manafort did, the easiest crimes to commit, convict him of were the ones where it was just very, very clear illegal use of, of money. So what we have is a money laundering has become a tool for almost all generic forms of law enforcement for a wide set of potential crimes because it is far more cut and blank than things about intent and, and, and other areas. 
Um, elder abuse is a big deal. I think I had a SAR filed on me for elder abuse this year, which was a, an illustrative point and a totally separate story, but I, I'm glad they filed, frankly. Uh, I was kind of waiting for somebody to call me and investigate the situation. The fact that they tipped you off. And <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah. I, it, no, they're it, not supposed to tell you. But. I, I can't be positive, but I bet if you query the database, I'll show up in it. And 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 that's actually, the one of the problems is that fit my category of crimes that had been occurring, but nobody had been reporting. I don't think, I think the rate of elder abuse was constant through that time horizon. Yes, demographically, we've had an increase in the number of elders, but the, there's been a, a hockey stick of, filings on it. Uh, that being said, um, uh, Jen, I, I, it's unfair to ask me to answer my own question, uh, but I, I, I will, which is that uh, number one is terrorism. Uh, but I think Jennifer's point is right. Terrorism isn't necessarily 9-11. Uh, I think the San Bernardino shooter could have been found in a traveling, if the traveling algorithm were running around here, you know, each of it, here's a person maxing out all these weird sources of credit and then wiring all this money one way to Saudi Arabia and then, you know, oh, whoa, going to a gun store and all these different, the financial thing that came out of that from the limited amount I saw in real time, because the other question is, do you want to use AML to prevent the crime, which is a hidden, in terrorism, I think we're trying to prevent in kind of minority report style very different than the other ones we were trying to somewhat catch, and right? the system is currently set up in the AML and terrorism space. It is an after-the-fact reporting system. Yeah. It is not live. Fraud, fraud payment screening, like when you get the text, is that really you buying the sweatshirt at the store? Um, that's, that's live uh, screening. Uh, sanction screening is live, but AML is is not. So, so I would also posit that the incidence of San Bernardino type terrorists may be higher in the future than the other. I could be wrong. Uh, number two would be sex trafficking. I just that's a Mazel's hierarchy, personal choice. Uh, you know, in terms of of you know uh, crime. Uh, number three would be high net worth tax evasion. Uh, I say that as a public finance economist who. You know, you want to raise revenue as efficiently as possible and then spend revenue for, for valuable purposes. There's a lot of high net worth tax evasion. The AML system, I think the audit rate is, is now equal for the bottom 10% of income as it is for the top one, right? But the marginal benefit to society to catch a billionaire cheating taxes versus, uh, you know, somebody earning minimum wage. Uh, I think you generate a tremendous amount of revenue that could be used for other social good and purposes. Um, that, 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 that would be my three, but that's a policy choice. And I'm not sure the central bank is the entity that we should have in our political system to rake those three over a plethora of other positions, uh, organized crime, for example. I'm going to say, I think we were going to take one more. Is that okay? Go ahead. I don't know the history of this field. So I'm just curious how we came here. I was grappling with the first principles question. In the field of privacy, we have a very important concept that liberal democracies do not run mass surveillance systems. Uh, the United States government uh, would not be able to screen every email or every text message or run searches inside it or store copies of it. You would need a, a law enforcement agents would need a warrant to go into Paul Manafort's email. And that would be based on some other information that you'd have to show a judge, and you've got that whole machinery of privacy. Why do we not see any of that around finance? Why are we running a mass surveillance system on finance? Yeah, I think it's a, a great question, um, and it's definitely um, policymakers' choice on where they wanted to set the balance on the spectrum between data privacy at one end of a spectrum and security uh, at the other. Um, and we've seen that where uh, different countries and communities come out on that issue change over time and it come across different ends of that spectrum. Um, and certainly in response to, to uh, different prompts, when something really bad happens on the security front, we move towards greater security and more surveillance uh, requirements on financial institutions. When we have significant data privacy concerns, a post Snowden, something that, like to that effect, then it moves in the other direction. Um, but those are policy choices made by governments that financial institutions then are required to uh, implement. 
So one reason I support raising the currency transaction threshold to its indexed amount, which is somewhere between fifty to sixty thousand dollars, depending on what you want to uh, index it for, uh, is exactly that which is this question about what level of information should be allowed to be found, what level, right? Because ultimately, this is an incredibly powerful tool for conviction purposes. I mean, people can do structuring of financial situations and somewhat un unknowingly, one of, the, one of the examples of somebody who didn't make the Hall of Fame is Bob Dole. Bob Dole got caught for structuring at Riggs Bank. Th those of you who, who know Washington, this was like the preeminent, it's Abraham Lincoln's bank. And Bob Dole, for whatever reason, Senator Dole from like cash, and uh, uh, Riggs Bank ultimately went down over an AML violation. Essentially, they got bought by, by a competitor, but I think it was Saudi Arabia or something, some Middle East country. They were doing some really bad shady stuff. Like there's some really bad stuff. But in this deep dive that came out, it turned out that Bob Dole liked to have cash, and every Friday he withdrew like eight thousand bucks, or every other Friday. And if you go to the bank and withdraw eight thousand dollars consistently over 10 years, you were supposed to be filed on. But the bank looked at the you know, Senate majority or minority leader and said, we are not going to file a SAR on this powerful senator who, you know, I think we can all realize just happened to pay for things in cash, right? And so this kind of history of it and the judgment of it is, gets to be very tricky. And I don't think there's enough of your voice and that position being heard in the general debate. And instead, there's a tremendous amount of the, the SAR database is free for me, put as much as you can there, because I you know, could use it to stop the next 9-11 or stop, catch some really bad guy or girl. So law enforcement tells us that the average price to buy a human being in the United States is $7,000. That's under the CTR. So this has been a fantastic discussion. I think we're going to have to figure out how to use this data. It's going to get used. And our mission is how are we going to regulate that, make it safe, have due process around the use of it. But um, I, I think these are just the urgent questions of our time. And I cannot thank you both enough for all your comments. So please join me in thanking the panel. Thanks to all of you. So from here, we're going to quickly segue into our closing keynote conversation. So there will be no breaks. Um, so please do stay here. I am committed to having you leave on time. I know many of you have international flights, and I have promised, and I am a person of my word. And so no matter what happens, if I have to cut the mic for my favorite, favorite former, former governor from the Central Bank of Kenya, I will do it. So we're going to um, uh, have the unenviable task, I think, of trying to um, sum up everything that uh, we've learned and everything these two distinguished gentlemen have learned over their entire careers in, um, in the final uh, 49 minutes of, uh, of the conference. And um, I appreciate their willingness to engage in this uh, wide-ranging conversation as a way of closing out um, our activities for the last uh, day and a half. Um, uh, let me just um, start maybe on a, a more personal uh, note, not, not personal to me, but personal to, to, to you both. Um, uh, Governor uh, Andungu um, uh, studied in Sweden, got a PhD in Sweden, and, and also has um, spent time reaching out uh, to and having conversations with uh, Gover Governor Ingves um, for, for many years. And I wonder whether you all might start by just saying a little bit about how you um, uh, began to connect and what you learned from each other. Thank you very much. Um, that's uh, for me, it's an honor. Uh, let me say that uh, I'm actually a CEDA output uh, f from capacity building by CEDA. Uh, and that's how I found myself in Sweden. And so my school life was funded by CEDA, so, uh, Swedish. Uh, 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 and, and, and it continues to do that in Africa. So I always tell everyone that I'm actually see the output and I'm going to continue actually building capacity. 
and, and, and the capacity doesn't stop there. Even when we go to institutions that are required, we are required to read those institutions, we also have to read in terms of building capacity. So the first time I met uh, Stefan was when I became governor in 2007. And uh, when we started talking, I, have, uh, I can say that I have benefited from three areas. And uh, we can, uh, of course, continue talking about other areas. The first thing was, uh, remember I talked about coming to the central bank. And the question was, how does central bank actually do its own business? with this massive cost. The central bank had only four branches in, in, in Kenya, and everybody else had to get currency from the central bank. Remember, central banks have the monopoly of issuing currency. So one of the things, one of the discussions with Stefan was, how do I get the currency management and even the, the, the modern vault management so that I can actually introduce currency centers in Kenya? We introduced three currency centers, and uh, of course, the usual thing about Kenya is that everybody wanted more. I don't know, it hasn't happened since then, but we had mapped out. But I was very happy that uh, even the system, the, the system of even uh, vault management, we actually borrowed from Sweden. The second thing was that we had now a large debate after M-Pesa success, the large, the large debate was how do you conduct monetary policy? Uh, when, uh, first of all, move away from the IMF uh, 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 targeting, uh, that is, um, um, uh, uh, targeting base money, and we have to move out because actually the basic assumptions are drying uh, that base money targeting was that the money multiplier was changing, the velocity was changing. So in the sense, I wanted him to influence the East African uh, governors, and we had a big conference, and he gave a keynote address on, um, on inflation targeting, and actually how Sweden has succeeded in, the, in that inflation targeting, and it works very well. And finally, I had to make a visit to Sweden so many times because I needed to understand how we can influence monetary policy that is communicating monetary policy making decisions. I think Kenya had already, the Central Bank of Kenya had already moved into having an executive monetary policy committee. And obviously we started even the structural models of forecasting inflation. Then the next thing is how do you actually anchor expectations? And that one of them was actually communication. It's the same thing about even M-Pesa and all that. So those three areas I have benefited, and I think uh, it has made the Central Bank of Kenya what it was. The eight years have been there, and that lingering uh, experience and even uh, reforms that I introduced are still there. So I at least attribute most of those to Stefan and my relationship with, with, with him. But I found that also my relationship around uh, Swedish institutions is also motivated by the fact that uh, I'm actually a, Swede, uh, a CEDA output. And uh, that is why capacity building is still in my DNA. Thank you. Uh, well, just to add to that, I mean, in the central bank community, there aren't that many other central bankers to talk to at home. <laughs> because usually there is only one central bank and, and you just don't go to the bankers and talk about your troubles. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. So, so you sort of constantly try to talk to other central bankers about what you are doing and how you go about doing things and you ask questions and then all of us regularly actually at the global level attend the, the same type of meetings. So. In addition to kind of bilateral work, we just meet and we discuss various issues that we find of interest for all of us, in going to the IMF, the World Bank, the BIS, other types of, uh, of meetings, because that's what, that is the community that you belong to. And that's where you kind of quietly can reflect on things without the whole thing ending up in the newspapers. And many of the things that you actually discuss are very practical. And what has struck me over the years, given that I've done this now for many, quite, a, quite, a, quite a number of years, is that when you get into central banking, many central bankers sort of approach this from the macro side, monetary theory, or doing macro monetary policy, inflation targeting. But all of a sudden, when you end up being the governor, you have sort of like a thousand people or more than that reporting to you. And your job is to run things. <laughs> to actually make sure that other people do things that you want them to do. And that's kind of a perennial issue among central bankers that you always discuss when you meet. And 
and some are ahead and some are behind and, and what all of us have in common, and this is a constant struggle, is that all the other ones in, in your own country know that the central bank, that's where the money comes from. And there's always somebody else who wants to get your money. And you don't want to just do that. <laughs> and then there are different ways of dealing with that, uh, that, that particular issue. Do you want to follow up? That, that, that's great. So I, I want to um, uh, switch to a topic uh, that we've been discussing a lot, which is uh, innovation. And I wonder if you could each reflect first on the role of uh, the central bank in being an actual innovator uh, in terms of use of technology, changes in procedures, um, changes in regulatory approaches. So how do you, uh, how do you foster innovation from within? Uh, maybe we'll just start from, from there and then I'll, I'll broaden it out. I think it, I think we, we, it, all, it all depends on where you are starting from. And I didn't want to follow up what Stefan has said, but uh, I think in the Kenyan Central Bank, when I, just, when I went there after so many years of training economists in the University of Nairobi and, and uh, even including AERC, African Economic Research Consortium, and even government think tanks, and I couldn't get economists I can talk to. Hmm. And I, the question was, how, how, how do you get researchers in the research department? Because it's so painful when a res, a res, a, the, the head of uh, the research department tells you that uh, we, we, we fight inflation and we use base money. And then you ask, and what is the relationship between base money and inflation? And he has no answer. <laughs> so what Stephanie is saying is that I wasn't sitting back and waiting for everybody to work. I actually had to write those, develop those models together and then change the way they, I asked, how do you, I asked the HR, how do you get people into the research department, economists? Oh, we advertise for management trainees and when we see in your CV you have studied economics, we push you to research. That's a disaster. When we actually say, the next time you advertise, I want you to advertise. Economists are known, uh, the economists don't jump into management trainees, they are not. What they do is that they, you say, I want a macroeconomist, I want a microeconomist, I want finance guy, or, and then you find them. And all of a sudden, the first batch we got was about nine, seven PhDs, and others, very senior masters. And all of a sudden, now I could sit back and just say what we didn't need to do, and it would be done. So that's the first thing about uh, the outcome, uh, managing a transition. The next thing is the innovations that came in. One of the things, of course, I didn't want to elaborate is even being confronted by the market participants that would like to bring this product into the market, the next thing, what do you tell them? That it cannot work. They have tested it can work. So the first thing is, let's do a pilot. In the meantime, you're actually preparing your team to try and understand how would this work and what are the intricacies or even risks that may come with it. And that is where you could say that the regulator becomes innovative because he's accommodative in terms of what he can do. And that's why when I talk about some of the areas that we have changed in terms of the way central bank looks at things and all that, is because of trying to see that we can actually pilot something and give the market the confidence that if it doesn't work along the lines we would like to, we can always close it down. That is perhaps an innovation in terms of uh, endogenous, try, uh, endogenous in the central bank trying to understand things, that things can work. In fact, when I talked about uh, Stefan introducing me to, uh, even trying to introduce currency management, the whole idea of having currency centers, even among us Kenyans, was not very clear. And the politicians were good at it and saying, oh, you're opening, opening central banks in those regions. No, I said, no, not branches. And those currency centers were housed by commercial banks. The Swedish model is that commercial banks were distributing currency anyway. Our model was that you actually, central bank issues currency. So essentially what do you do? You take your currency into a currency center and you are given space by a commercial bank. And so I argued that over time, we will transfer this function to you. That for, for me, that was innovation, but then the market took it very well. So there are some areas that we guided the market, but there are some areas actually the market gave us um, 
uh, run for our, should I say, our brains, and then we had to actually resort to let's pilot and then see what what kind of uh, um, uh, risk mitigations can we adopt so that we don't want to stifle what you're trying to do, but at the same time, we don't want to bring something that if you bring something up, you introduce something in the market and it fails, the regulator is not forgiven so easily. Mm -hmm. The market is forgiven so easily, but not the regulator. Yeah. Uh One of the issues when, when you run a central bank is, and this is I think hold for in, in many, many countries, is that you can, you have the privilege of hiring the best and the brightest, and many, many highly educated people. Uh, but it's a constant managerial challenge to get these people to actually do things that you want them to do. <laughs> and that's quite a, quite a, a, quite a challenge because it's quite a difference between coming from the academic field, for academia, and sort of think about things. Uh, that's quite different compared to having to, let's say, implement, just for the sake of the argument, inflation targeting. And that's a challenge to sort of realize that now um, it's not about how many articles on inflation targeting you have read. <laughs> it's actually about when this is going to be implemented mm -hmm. and who is going to talk to whom. And how do we explain this to our superiors? And how do we actually get this thing done? And what has struck me, having worked for many years now with many, many talented people, is that a good number of them are actually quite risk averse. And that means that when it comes to crunch time, you have to choose between A and B. They sort of, it bothers them, and, 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 and they just can't choose. That's left to me. And then I say, well, guys, you need, you need to understand that I'm paid to decide things. So either you tell me what's right or wrong, or I decide anyway, because my job is to decide. And I can't leave the room. You can leave the room, but I can't. <laughs> so let's work together on, on, on this. And this is a sort of a constant, constant challenge when it comes to uh, running, running a central bank. Another challenge, and this is completely different compared to when you are in the, in the private sector, let me use the concept time to market. You can build the best cell phone in the world from a sort of an engineering point of view, but if, it's three, it, if, it, if it comes three years after your competitors, no one will buy it. When you work in a central bank, no one on the outside will ever know when you are done or not. So you can always, you can always write another memo, or you can always improve on your last memo. And that means that when you run a central bank, you have to create your own sense of urgency because you are the only institution in your, in, in, in your country and you have to keep pushing people so that things eventually get done. While at the same time, to, 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 to your point, getting criticized is always there, so you have to be careful because you have to move the whole system uh, but if you move too quickly, then mistakes will be made, and everything you do will always be turned against you by somebody else. And then you have to sort of uh, survive that uh, part, of the, uh, part of the exercise. And that creates a very, very special environment in terms of how you actually go about uh, doing, uh, doing things. Um, both, both really uh, terrific insights. So, We've been talking a lot about the role of central banks in financial inclusion. Uh, there are lots of different strategies uh, that, that central banks can take. I wonder, uh, first, if you'd briefly just say, how important is it that central banks are involved in financial inclusion as opposed to other actors? And then I want us to explore a bit, what does it mean? What kind of role do you want the central bank to take on, whether that's direct provision or enabling as you know, two, two kinds of strategies? Maybe we'll start with Governor Ingves this time. Uh, I mean, generally, when it comes to our legal framework, our uh, responsibility is to uh, work and try to provide a, and a safe and efficient payment system. I mean, that's in a legal sense very vaguely put. So, and no one has really defined what it means. So essentially, that has left it to us within the central bank 
to fill those words with content so that you actually do something, uh, which is not a legal obligation, it's a sort of, in some sense, uh, directional. And here, actually, uh, digit, uh, inclusion matters because if you don't have it, then you have some kind of a problem with your financial sector. Mm -hmm. And that's why, if you want to run a safe and efficient payment system, you really would, would like to have maximum financial inclusion. And then you sort of work on how to get to that point. But you can't force banks to do this and that, or you can't force the general public to do this and that. But what you can do and what, you, what we do is to act as a catalyst. And here the distribution of notes and coins is a good example because uh, it costs money to handle money. And people tend to uh, forget that. And then most people come to the central bank and said, we would be incredibly happy if the central bank is willing to subsidize this whole thing because then the problem kind of goes away. But what that essentially means is that that means less of a dividend to the government. So there is a cost to society as a whole to run a highly inefficient system. Now, in order to run and operate a more efficient system, then you need to get all the interested parties in the same room. And that means that you have to have people from the banks, you have consumers, you have to have retailers, you have to have businesses, and you have the supervisory authorities in the same room so that you get to an agreement on what the map and what the world actually looks like. And there you can sort of, and this is a popular term nowadays, you can sort of nudge all the interested parties into moving in, the direct, in, in, the, in a proper kind of direction. And usually these, these individuals and these organizations have great difficulties uh, talking to each other because essentially they're struggling among themselves about trying to push the cost to somebody else. Uh, but we can always get them in the same room. Mm -hmm. And we can force them to sit there until there is some kind of an agreement on how, how this is, uh, this is uh, managed. And that's quite, uh, uh, that's quite helpful. What also has struck me over the years is that in many fields, where we really don't have a formal responsibility at all, in the eyes of the general public, they think that we have something to do with the particular money, matter because my name is on the notes. Mm -hmm. And then they say, somebody's got to be responsible for this. And, and that means that in a very kind of subtle, soft way, our responsibilities go beyond what we actually are required to do. It, it's interesting to me that th th this is a very common way, I think, that many central bankers describe how they engage in decision making and in standard setting and rule making as a, a kind of exercise of soft power. And so I'm wondering, and then, and then I'll switch to, to, to Governor Ndungu, but I wonder if you could just say a little bit about um, when you see that that use of soft power is appropriate versus you know, saying this is the rules for payment or, or go away, or we're providing the payment infrastructure, this is how it's going to work, go away. Once in a while you get to a point where nothing happens and then you say, okay, this is the way it's going to be, and if you want to do the clearing with the central bank, these are the conditions. So that's one, that, that's one issue. But the other issue, and, and, and here uh, the Riks Bank is a good, good case, we have never had supervision. Supervision has always been handled in a separate authority, but we've been around for hundreds of years. And when things really, really go wrong, supervision does not matter. Then, because people know that supervisors don't have any money, all the money is in the central bank. And that's well understood in the banking community. So being a private sector banker, you don't put yourself in a position where you know that if things go wrong, you have to come and ask for money at the central bank, not having delivered on certain things in the past. Because then you know for sure that the central bank has the upper hand. Because at that moment, the central bank decides whether you'll be around the next day or not. And so that's also kind of an element of this. So you, you want to have a, you want to carry out a decent conversation in peacetime <laughs> but also make sure that people do understand that when things go wrong, things will change. That's great. Governor Ndungu. Yeah. 
Yeah, the subject matter of financial inclusion is very interesting, as you started by saying. But uh, different different countries, for example, I think it would be in Sweden, you would not really talk about financial inclusion because virtually everybody is financially included uh, in uh, different degrees. But when you come to countries like in Africa, for example, in Kenya, this is a really a serious public policy because it's a market access, uh, it's a question of market access. And market accessibility and different markets, for that matter, in general, is actually very, very important it, because it helps the poor in terms of accessing the markets. They can sell their labor or even access, uh, sell their wares. But financial market is very, very important because it allows them to save and perhaps invest and even enrich their asset base so they can escape the cycles of poverty. The whole issue is how do you do that? By the time I, I entered the central bank, there was the idea was that, oh, we can introduce microfinance so that microfinance can establish branches closer to the population. But uh, I think for almost uh, uh, six years, the microfinance bill was there, but the parliament, again, had not approved even the, the guidelines. So, so the, I think I quickly, what I did was, no, the guidelines were not yet prepared. I think I quickly realized that there was a friend working with the UNDP in, uh, in Nigeria, and they had developed a draft of guidelines. I borrowed that and we changed. But even when we did that, most of the banks that started as microfinance had already given up and they became banks. So the whole issue is that you have to start all over again. Of course, we started um, uh, community-based microfinance, nationwide microfinance, we draw a threshold of uh, uh, capital, core capital requirements. But this did not do the, the trick because everybody was waiting for so many years. So then that is why I'm saying then you have to try different angles and different, uh, should I say, uh, uh, instruments that can help. And that's why when I come to, uh, when I come to agency banking, for example, or even uh, M-Pesa, mobile phone financial services, they became the quickest instruments to achieve that. Today, when you go to Kenya, there are more microfinance than, than, than there were. Uh, 10 year, uh, 20 years ago, but it is because they are now moving in tandem with how what microfinance is doing. Most of them are agents of banks at, at the same time. So, but what was the basic constraint? Why was financial inclusion not working? Because banks never realized that they didn't have the technology or they did not invest in the technology of trying to manage micro accounts. Micro accounts means people with raw incomes and uh, they have to open bank accounts that low income is sometimes is so low, sometimes it's irregular in terms of flow. So sustaining an, a, 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 an account in the bank was very, very expensive. So, and then from then on, if you get a technology that can manage micro, mi micro accounts, then you can see what actually happens. And that's why in my talk today, when I talked about virtual savings account, for me, it was really an eye opener for the banks. And that's why all of a sudden we found that we moved from about 4.3 million accounts to about 28 million accounts. And um, mobile phone accounts are even more, much higher than that. And I've seen that it has worked the same way in Tanzania. It has worked the same way in, in Rwanda. So the whole issue of uh, accessibility to markets is very, very important. But financial markets are very, very critical. So looking for investment and even instruments to do that becomes very critical. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about uh, digital cash, and I want to return to that um, uh, topic now. Um, I, I think it might make sense, uh, starting with, with Governor Ingves, to, to talk a little bit about the role of uh, private money and public money. What is digital cash? Has it play a role in that? Should we have, is there an, an advantage uh, from a financial inclusion standpoint of uh, central banks offering uh, digital currency. Is that fundamentally different or fundamentally the same from offering an account uh, directly at, at the financial institution? How is that different from holding a bank account? I mean, I think there's a, a lot of um, maybe confusion in the market about what these different, these different kinds of approaches might mean. And there's a lot of um, what I'll describe as froth about uh, Bitcoin and, and the possibility of uh, of non-fiat uh, digital currency being important in this space. So I, I wonder if you just reflect on the appropriate role and way of thinking about um, digital cash in relation to public and private money creation. 
Uh, it's hard to come, I don't know, I don't have the perfect answer to this because this is an issue which has been with us for hundreds of years. So in that sense, there is nothing new under the, new under the sun. Uh, but let me start way, way, uh, way, way back. And my institution has provided money in one form or the other for 350 years. Now, then if physical cash goes away, then that, of course, raises the issue. Should you just let it happen and say, oh, we didn't keep track of this thing. It just sort of happened, and now we only have private money. Or should, should you carefully consider which way to go? And that's essentially what we are, we are doing. Now, today, this is considered to be something entirely new, but I read a paper the other day uh, where uh, uh, the author had looked into what central banks have done in the past, and the conclusion was that it's only roughly over the past 70 years or so it has been impossible for the general public to hold the deposit with some central banks. So in that sense, this is not, not a new, uh, not a new uh, issue. Ultimately, it's going to require some kind of a value judgment. But we do know if history gives us any guidance and take this country as one example, you had a period with private bank money only. And that was not successful at all. So ultimately, at the end of the day, one way or the other, governments need to be involved in this because they tend to back up the financial system in one, uh, in one form or the other, being it everything physical or everything digital, and that's why, why this, this matters. And then we have, and I think this is where we will end up in many countries, for maybe uh, over time, we have sort of hybrids when it comes to this, because you can, you can create a central bank digital currency which is sort of token-based. You can create something which is very similar to phys physical cash, but it's digital. Or you can create something which is account-based, or you can create sort of a, a hybrid. Ultimately, it's going to take some kind of a value judgment to, 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 to do that. Too early to tell uh, which way uh, this is going to end up over time. But having said that, and others uh, refer to, to what is happening in China today, and you have these new tech companies, but they have just recently been required to hold, to back up their deposits with a 100% reserve requirement. Well, that's essentially turning their private money into central bank money. That's, that's what came out of it, despite the fact that the whole thing sort of started as a completely private sector undertaking. Mm -hmm. So here I guess that different countries will end up with, uh, uh, with different solutions, but ultimately it's really a political issue in the sense that money, your own currency, is part of the nation state. And there is no way around that. I mean, we used to have old kings in some countries, presidents, and all sorts of stuff, and, and, and people that people recognize on the, on, on the notes, because part of a nation is the money that you have created in that nation. It's only if you have been completely unsuccessful uh, in doing so that you end up with changing to somebody else's currency. But then we talk about miserable cases like Venezuela and Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe and, and those, uh, those issues. So my conclusion so far, and, and, and my apologies for, for talking so long about this, is that ultimately at the end of the day, it's the political economy of this that will decide uh, which way you will go. So this will never be decided by economists only because it's such a sensitive, uh, sensitive issue uh, which way you would uh, prefer to go. Governor Ndugu, do you want to add to that? And, and yeah, I, I can maybe follow up with uh, some, like a question asking, the crema for, wh why now the crema for digital currency? And maybe you could tie up with the previous, previous session, they talked about uh, AML, anti-money laundering, and uh, obviously uh, when it is digital currency, does it make it easier for monitoring? And maybe, we, maybe there's a question we can follow up. Um, when I joined the central bank, I, one of the things was about monetary policy and then 25% of the currency in circulation is outside the banking system. Then the question was, what do, how, what, how would you conduct monetary policy when there's such a large amount of currency outside the banking system? And so the whole thing is 
Kremering for digital currency, is it going to be easier in terms of AML CFT regime? I know I went to, I joined the Central Bank, I, I, I've been unlucky because I joined the Central Bank when uh, Kenya was in the dark gray list in the FATF classification. And I had to try and reverse that because essentially we were getting into serious, serious issues even with correspondence banking. And one of the things I argued strongly was that it is the informality of markets and informal markets. The moment we move away from informality of markets, then we can actually even monitor the currency in circulation in a, in a better way. And, uh, uh, and the financial inclusion was one of those success stories. So essentially, I don't know whether the crema for, uh, for, 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 for digital currency right now is to make sure that we have better control or is it, um, I, I'm, 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 I'm trying to ask myself, but I do, I do think that would, be, would make a, a lot of sense, especially if it's going to aid in terms of uh, transactions or payment system. That for me would, be, would make a lot of difference. And also if it's going to support financial inclusion. But not digital currency the way it is being seen, like we have a cryptocurrency trying to trade. I was giving an example of a Bitcoin. I think the first time we went for a conference talking about electronic money in uh, Abu Dhabi, the telcos told us with the governor Ben Onduru of Tanzania that uh, we are going to affect money supply before you know, you know, money supply process before you, you, you know it. And we asked them, how? Because back to Stefan said, the, the Chinese are asking for 100% backing. Electronic, electronic money in Kenya, that is the M-Pesa type of uh, transactions, were 100% backed. So there was no way telcos would even influence money because they were actually uh, doing shopkeeper kind of function. You change cash into electronic units of cash, and that's all. And it's back to 100%. It's not a deposit. So anyway, those are the, there, are, there are more issues. But I think the more we try to understand where we are going and where we are coming from, maybe the better. Because then digital currency will be understood in a better way. It's not changing the way we actually know about money. If we change that, then obviously we go into an unknown territory. But I think Stefan has said it is, an, it is not unknown. It's actually always known. It's only that we, because of the current times, we forget what has happened in the last 70 or so years. Mm. I like when, I, when I'm teaching my financial regulation class, I, I, when we're dealing with this, I like to show pictures of you know, uh, banknotes and ask people, or my students, if they have any idea what this is. Uh, and it's an interesting thought, thought experiment to see. Um, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about um, the ways in which central banks might need to adopt their own cultures and uh, human resources and approaches uh, as there are more and more non-bank actors um, operating in the system. So um, uh, maybe we'll start um, with the Kenyan case. And, and uh, with the rise of M-Pesa and the need to negotiate with the, the telcos and the telco regulators, uh, how did the culture of the Central Bank of Kenya change? Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's quite interesting because um, it, I always say that every challenge has its own uh, solution. Once you think so, so I, I mean, when, once you are focused in terms of a solution. And um, one of the things about uh, the, the, the way the pilot was conducted in, in Kenya for, before the M-Pesa was launched, is actually one of them is one of the teams trying to make sure that this cannot work, it's a pyramid scheme. On the, other, on the other side, the other team's just saying, actually we can find solutions way around it. At the end of the day, just like Stefan said, it depends on who is the team leader. And the team leader wants solutions. And it doesn't want solutions to block the, the innovation. You want solutions to make sure that even if it does work, doesn't work, work, does not work today, there is a promise that it can work because sometimes some of the innovations are ahead of their time. And, um, and, and, and that is one aspect of it. The first thing is that we, didn't, we did not have a, a national payments department in the central bank because even though it was a MADI, there was we didn't have even experts in that area. So the, the whole process is saying, if this is the way we're going to work, then we have to push very hard to get 
experts in that area in the national payments who can actually also help in trying to understand uh, the market. It is going to be very difficult for a regulator to sit back and maybe the private sector telling you exactly what is happening out there. You are supposed to be the regulator and that the traditional way is that you are a regulator. So essentially you have to have the knowledge to match what the market is telling you. And those are the, the, the should I say, the initial months of Actual, actual speed in trying to, to, to try to understand what the market is proposing and trying to understand how then can you, can you actually um, push this forward. What I did was always to use the, 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 available, uh, the available network. And one of the, the ones that I used in Kenya was the FSD. FSD network have done a great job uh, in, in Africa today because they provide various uh, knowledge-based studies and even data to try and understand what is happening. So what we did was to invite FSD so that we can use their network even globally to actually come up with some draft regulations to understand what is happening. I call them draft regulations because unless the parliament also passes them, you cannot use them. But what, as, soon as, as, as long as they are draft regulations, you use them because you can use them to, to issue guidelines. And that is the starting point. Even the institutional capacity of the central bank was helped by the draft guidelines. In the end, they became the guidelines, but uh, the first thing is to do that. So essentially, if you are confronted by a new idea, the most important thing is actually to see how you can, instead of setting the market away, you try to encourage the market to move on while you're also studying the situation. And that is what's helped the central bank institution. And so many other issues that we can, I can give examples, that is the, the, the direction that I took to make sure that the institutions is not left behind. Even if it doesn't work, the knowledge base that is left in the central bank works very well in terms of institutional building and even capacity building at the central bank. Governor this, I wonder if you could talk about the cultural change that might be needed at, at the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision and at the BIS and the other standard setting bodies as the world evolves uh, to include many more non-bank players, potentially very large social media platforms, the big tech companies, what needs to change at the standard setting bodies to you know, figure out what the right set of new approaches for that world uh, might look like? Uh, you just need to accept that the world is changing and that you can't turn back time. And then a major issue in the future will be when somebody will have to decide if it walks like a bank and it quacks like, quacks like a bank and it swims like a bank, then it probably is a bank. And that's, a, that's an issue that one would, is going to have to deal with one way or the other, and it's, it's, it's definitional. And then, of course, some, some of these new providers of, of services will have to accept that. Uh, because you can't have, and referring to their panel before us, you can't have players where let's say AML rules don't apply just because they call themselves a tech company. I mean, that's not really, really acceptable. But that also means that we probably will have to accept different types of banks in the future, that some of them will be more kind of narrow banks. Maybe some of them are more kind of payment services providers. And, 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 and some of them do everything the way some many banks have done for a long, long time in the in, in, in the past, but you, you just can't, you just have to live with, live with that and on the regulatory side decide where to draw the line saying that now you have come so close to dealing with financial services in, in such a way that you are actually a bank. And part of it is going to be dealing with the risk aspect of this because banks have to have capital because they blow up once in a while and that causes a huge problem and a huge cost to society as a whole. And there is an enormous negative externality coming out of a banking crisis. And if you get new players into the system that run the risk of creating similar types of externalities for society as a whole, then you actually have to say, OK, the, not beyond this, this is what you have to comply with. But that, of course, will be difficult for the Basel Committee and other committees to deal with over time because the, when the world is changing, you just have to uh, you just have to change because at the same and at the same time, it doesn't make sense to uh, regulate certain entities where the whole business have moved to other entities. Mm -hmm. So 
it's a tricky, uh, it's a tricky one. A constant struggle and yeah. innovation. Yes. Um, let me ask um, one final question of, of both of you, and then I'm going to open it up. Um, so we've been struggling a lot over the last couple of days, and the project is over the last year to think, you know, uh, quite um, uh, big picture about what a central bank of the future might look like, should look like, in a way that promotes financial inclusion. Let me give you each a, a couple of minutes to say what you think um, should be key elements of such a central bank. Um, again, if you were able to live in the world we live in, that is, you live in a real world, but but you have um, the ability to project forward in ways that free you from the, the current institutional constraints that we're all faced. So maybe I'll, I'll, um, I'll start with um, Governor Ndungu and, and ask you to, to sketch that out for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, I, I started by saying that uh, central banks and uh, the way I looked at it when I joined the central bank was that actually it's an agent of market development even though it's a regulator. Because the moment you start waving an axe, especially in the, in the markets where we belong, um, you are likely to find that uh, you'll be killing the market. And if you, are, if you are lucky to survive, because again, there's, this politics uh, is more broader, then you, 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 you'll not, you, you'll, you'll find yourself talking, you'll find yourself that uh, you are all alone in that process. So, and, Encouraging the market becomes very, very important because once the market has already formula, for example, let me give you like the payment system. All of a sudden there was no payment system and PESA wants to come into the market. And we come up with regulations. We even, even the legal system was actually approved finally. We even created a space where you can even have standalone kiosk, payments kiosk. But they have never managed to stand their own. Actually, they are still in the banks. They are still, except a few forex bureaus that have tried to do that because we added the component of foreign exchange remittances to try, to try and formalize and remove Hawara from the underground. And it has worked well that in that way, but they, 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 they are not stand own because they still believe that you can have that transactions platform still in a bank and operate that. You can still be in a bank and operate. But the moment the market, you nudge the market towards the development that you'd like, and then you can, once the market is upright and moving on, then the central bank re retains its core function. And that is what I believe the future central bank should be, is that you do not run away from nudge, helping the market or even helping the market to, or intervening, creating uh, appropriate interventions in the market so that you move in that direction and then leave the market in, to, 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 to thrive on its own. Let me give two examples. The first one was that how do you create credit reference bureaus in economies like ours to share information? I started by telling politicians that we are going to share negative information so that we actually can push the market to the next level. We want CRBs that can create your credit scores, and obviously, in the long run, we want to change the collateral technology that was in use. But if you go into, uh, in, a, in a very, uh, should I say, uh, focused way and say that you want in both negative and positive information, you're not going, you will not get, you will not manage to get through the, 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 the parliamentarians. So the first thing is that they accepted. After some years, then we, I went back and I told the Finance Committee of Parliament that we, know, we want objectivity here. So we need to bring positive and negative information. And then they accepted. So we created a project, uh, and then CRBs were there. They were being supervised by the central bank. Then that project moved and became now like a, like a, like a good uh, consultancy unit that would help CRBs uh, work through. But then, uh, is it five years ago they started, no, six years ago they started using that. When the government, when the president appoints you as an ambassador, the first thing is to see, bring your CRB certificate. Then, of course, I had already, I was, I had already gone out of the central bank. They said, oh, where is this Jugunandungu? He actually made, made, you know, pushed us to this idea. So you can see that we, we have managed to create an institution that is working, but it is a process of nudging the market to that development. There are several examples that we can give, but one of the things like now is that there is no longer any controversy about any telcos in terms of managing uh, payment systems. 
There's no confusion anymore because they know exactly what, what is the dividing line. Because everybody, the telcos thought they were participating in the money market. But the moment you create that market, the central bank is never involved anymore in terms of negotiations between commercial banks and telcos in terms of the products they are going to roll out. The central bank just looks at the products and says that's it. Yeah, this is this is appropriate. So my idea of the future of the central bank is to make sure that, and, and especially in developing markets, that you help the market understand where it's going, try to navigate and intervene where there could be risks, and try to straighten up the market for them. Once they are upright and they are moving, and they are developing the market in their own market segment, then you move. The central bank should move on and to, to its own core market, but. We live in a world where there are segmented markets. Until we flatten those segments of the market, segmentation will create a lot of dangers in terms of, should I say, structural change, even economic transformation. But I know where central banks in Africa have moved in and flattened those segments of the market, it has worked very well. That's the way I would look at it. I would say that it is developmental in nature, but there are limits you cannot always carry the market with you, you didn't need to remain in the segment of the market where you, you, your, your speciality lie, and also the capacity of the central bank is, well go, is going to be recognized in that sector. Uh, monetary policy, not, policy is not going to disappear. It will stay because somebody's got to be there to, to produce a reasonably stable price level. Whether we call it inflation targeting or something else, mm -hmm doesn't really matter, but the key issue has stayed the same for hundreds of years. That somebody has to, to make sure that uh, you don't end up with too much, uh, too much inflation or deflation uh, for that matter. Financial stability is definitely not going to go away. I mean, that, that will be uh, uh, with us uh, forever, I think, because financial instability creates so much economic destruction in any economy, so you just don't want to go there. And then in addition to that, given that central banks actually have a balance sheet, so everything you do when you run a central bank passes through the balance sheet of, of the central bank in one form or, or, or the other. Just, that's just the way it is. And having a balance sheet means that you relate to the, uh, to the financial sector in one form or the other, because you do things together with the various participants in the financial sector via your financial, uh, your balance sheet. And that creates uh, an environment presently where you need to provide uh, uh, efficient, uh, efficient central bank, clearing 24-7 uh, clearing in central bank money. And then based on that, you allow the financial sector to evolve in such a way that the general per perception among the general public is that, that these things are managed and handled and produced in the private sector in an, in an efficient way. And uh, the central bank should not uh, block the evolution of that uh, uh, efficiency. In addition to that, and I should have mentioned that mentioned it earlier, what what comes comes now when we're not so f not really anymore focusing on the distribution of notes and coins. Um, more and more uh, effort needs to go into dealing with the consequences of everything being digital and that's having the capacity to deal with uh, cyber risk mm -hmm. in different uh, different shapes and forms. And that, of course, takes us into a completely new world and a completely new environment in terms of the competences that you actually need to understand these things. And that's because when people think about the central bank, they think about vaults. <laughs> and they think about physical money, or I get constant emails about people complaining to me saying, why is it that our gold is located in London and in New York and not at home? And things like that, because that's the way it used to be in the old days. Now all of this will be replaced by actually understanding in the digital world what happens and how do you ensure that it is safe.
Thank you, Chris Glover from the Gates Foundation. So this has been a wonderful opportunity to, to look into the lives of two central bankers from two different markets, but seeing how similar actually the challenges have been, how lonely the job sometimes is, but how much support you get from each other and from other central bankers around the world. So this is truly an inspiring message to, to hear, and I really appreciate that you took the time to share that with us. I did want to ask a question that's central to this conference, and that is, We've talked about inclusion and the role of central banks maybe in promoting inclusion, and we know that not all central banks have a mandate here and so on. But I want to broaden the challenge a little bit. We, earlier this morning, we asked inclusion to what end? And one reason might be to prevent and, and help people get out of extreme poverty, especially. Do central banks have an interest in alleviating poverty? You can have stable prices. You can have a well-functioning payment systems. You can have safe and sound banks, and still have lots of people living in poverty. So what is the interest of central bank in this subject? It's hard. I mean, it's hard to deal with it because it's not within your mandate. And that, of course, raises the perennial issue how to deal with these types of issues because given that people do understand that you, can, you produce money in the central bank, then from time to time, others want to use your money for all sorts of purposes that they feel are sort of good for society as a whole. But still, you need to find some way of, where, some way of drawing the line, because if you get involved in everything, uh, then eventually you don't know what you're doing anymore. And, that, and there are so many nice things that you could, uh, could do, but you need to stay within your, uh, within your mandate. But what you can do is... Uh, talk to others about what you, as a central banker, think is good for society as a whole, despite it not being part of your uh, mandate. Uh, you know, Chris, one of the things about uh, central bank mandate and, the, mandate and the way it is written in the Constitution is that uh, there shall be a central bank. For example, in Kenya, we revised the Constitution, I think, 2010. There shall be a central bank which formulates monetary policy. But if you go into, and then the rest of it will be in the act. If you go to the act, it is, there's, there will be all those functions, and at the end of it is that it has to support government's development agenda, which is so broad. But let me go to your question about poverty. I believe that financial inclusion will solve poverty sustainably. But you see, the way you push that to that end, where you have sustainable poverty reduction, it's actually assuming that all other institutions will pay, play their part. And that's one aspect. And um, I think from recent studies, including even what I think um, uh, was presented yesterday about women in banking, because I personally have seen that women can actually even save and invest in the products that cannot be encroached. But that, that's one, of the, one side of the story. And we cannot actually have this attribution to the central bank. But you know that it started and uh, ignited the process, and other institutions can take over. But the other one, when you come to the general aspect of monetary policy, and especially in countries where we come from ourselves, monetary policy actually can affect relative price movements. And obviously, it, it's going to be very critical in terms of uh, public policy, public policy being a reduction, in, uh, a poverty reduction. And the other function in developing countries that we worry about and everybody watches in the, in the news and the newspapers every morning is the currency movement, which actually related to your foreign exchange uh, management. And uh, the moment the currency is moving, and I, I gave an example today that uh, if your currency moves by 10%, you're likely to get a, a, commission, of, a commission of inquiry in the, in the parliament. I have, I've had so many myself. You know, because essentially you need to explain to us why the currency moved by 10%. What is happening here? Why is the currency more important? From the politician, it's national pride that your currency is strong, but we always tell them that is bad, but you will not get it through to them. You can try. And, but the other aspect of it is that, in the general case, is that it actually leads to relative price changes, which is massive. It can actually, there, there will be losers and gainers. So in a sense, it's a whole debate of what is development here and what is the attribution to the central bank. But they are direct attack, they are direct uh, functions of the central bank, but they are also indirect that we can influence in some way. Can I, yes. can I just add to, to that, and it's sort of that if you lose price stability, the poor will lose the most. 
because they are the last ones to understand what is going on, and they have nowhere to run. All the wealthy people and the well-educated people, they know exactly what to do and where to go. And depending on in what part of the world you happen to be located, some of them go to Miami, others go to other places. Uh, but the poor have no choice. They will lose everything, particularly if you end up with hyperinflation. And that's why it's so incredibly important to try as best as you can to, to stick to monetary stability, because that is definitely a good thing for the poor. Thank you, Michael. You yielded our time to us. But thank you and Adrian and all your team for an amazing conference. Just building on something that I'm trying to wrap my head around. So both you governors talked about how lonely the job is all, every Thing that you do in terms of coordination. Uh, there's a lot of myopia out there, like you yourselves talked about some of your brightest economists and everyone, and we see it in all kinds of sectors. Do we really have the ability to chew gum and walk at the same time? So for example, every time there's a global financial crisis, so many people are thrown back into poverty. So many people we're trying to help, middle classes, the poor. And obviously financial inclusion is something that we absolutely have to go forward on. And as central bankers are becoming more involved and more politicians want to have their hands in the cookie jar, what is the risk to the central bankers to be able to balance those two in the critical times? Well, if you are a central banker or a bank supervisor, your job is to say no. And that's hard to do, always. I, I think. Uh, um, I personally, my experience is that we live on a very tight rope. Here you are, we talked about monetary policy, but when it comes to conducting monetary policy, in, for example, some economies uh, where I have come from, the Horn of Africa, which is ravaged by uh, weather, weather, weather cycles, most of the inflation will be supply driven. It's a supply side issue, but you don't have instruments for monetary policy, for the supply side. And the, the worst bit of it is that when I talk about Horn of Africa, I'm talking about drought and energy prices. And sometimes there is always a coincidence that also energy prices globally are also changing. You can see that the impact is massive. What, what is, you have sleepless nights because you don't have supply side instruments to deal with supply side inflation, so you have to use the, de the demand side instruments. So it means that in the short term, if you are lucky, you have to plug the economy into a temporary recession until the crisis is over, because you only want to prevent prices, the shock in prices, from becoming a plateau, so that uh, from becoming permanent to become a plateau, so that after the crisis, the price can come back. And that is a very, very uh, tight issue. And uh, we have gone through those cycles. Actually, you, are, you always w watch, um, uh, we used to watch the month of January, February, and, and March, because that's where if there will be a, 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 a crisis hitting food prices, you'll know. You have to start step, uh, looking at it from there. And what, what is happening here? At the end of the day, you have different regulators who should have different buffers so that they create economic resilience here. Central bank can only keep or oh, have one buffer. That's foreign exchange reserves just in case you want to support the market in times of crisis. But when there's drought, that's the time you realize that there are no food supplies in the, in the, in the, in the, in the where you anticipated. And even fuel reserves can only last you 21 days. And all that, and all that, and all that. Fiscal surplus is a dream that we haven't even had in, in our own country. So oh, oh, you can see what keeps, it's at the end of the day who is left hanging on in a very precarious position is always the central bank. So essentially, you know, that creates the loneliness in that position because you're watching, in, you're watching inflation data coming from the, the Bureau of Statistics and you're asking yourself what is really happening. You are watching every day what is happening to uh, fuel prices and you are also watching uh, in, in, in our own region, uh, can, uh, the, the, the electricity is actually very much um, hydro. And so when there's a drought, you see that's the impact. So those are the issues that come up, among other, many other institutional issues. 
So I think we've um, we've covered a lot of ground in the last day and a half, and even in this last um, hour uh, panel, it's been a, a really rich and interesting conversation. And I really appreciate not only our, our panelists um, uh, for our concluding uh, keynote conversation, but all of our panelists and all of our participants um, in this conference. Um, I've learned a lot. I think it's going to really help us push the conversation uh, forward, uh, uh, help uh, in partnership with the Gates Foundation. I really think about the future of central banking and its role in financial inclusion, which I think uh, all of us having spent uh, the last day and a half here think is pretty, uh, pretty critical. Um, we look forward to continuing the conversation with you after this um, day, so I hope you don't mind that um, we're going to repay your kindness by, in participating today by reaching out to you um, over the coming months uh, to continue that conversation, uh, continue to push forward with greater uh, uh, details um, and with uh, hopefully a developing vision for um, how we can push the field forward. So uh, please join me in thanking our panelists and thank yourselves as well. I'm sure Christy has some logistics to um, uh, go over with you, so uh, pause for just one second. Thanks. So for those of you who are taking the 5.30 shuttle to ride back to the airport, if you'll just m grab your luggage in that same luggage room where you dropped it off, you have to be the one to go get it because we don't know which one is yours. 